Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, May the 11th, and I'd like to call this. Today is May the 19th. I'd like to call the Citizen Police Oversight Agency Board to order. Um, Ms. Varela, uh, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Present. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Here. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, Chair French. All your members are present. Thank you. And <clears throat> with that, could I get a approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Barella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And with the next item on the agenda, uh, approval of the consent agenda, I just want to explain to the board members a little bit of, of why it's here. At our last meeting, we said we had a meeting to find out exactly um, what information and we want to continue getting concerning these cases. Um, I don't think we came to a final conclusion. Uh, the uh, subcommittee has not come to a final conclusion. So I had all the cases that, uh, complaint cases that were cleared this month added to a consent agenda. We don't have to vote on them, but I just wanted you to be aware of them for you to have, I think, I'm not sure, I think Diane sent the original complaint findings letter. And if there's any of those that you would like to more information, I'm gonna usually you pull it at the date of the consent agenda, the ones you want pulled. But since I, I didn't get some of the information I needed, and we were kind of late getting this process done. I am just going to uh, not ask for any this time. And if there's any that I need, I will ask to present them the next, at the next board meeting. So with that, I'm gonna just ask, I guess, for approval of this consent agenda. And all it is is saying, these are the cases that we have a right to review and get more information if necessary uh, for next month's meeting. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Farella, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimous. Thank you. And we'll move <laughs> on to agenda number four. Um, were there any public comments, Ms. Farrella? I know we got the notice that there weren't any. None have come in so far. Diane, uh, are Chair there Friend, any? I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, there was no written comments, but I'm not aware of anyone uh, waiting in the waiting room to provide public comment in person, but you may want to ask Diane. Diane, do we have anyone in the waiting room? No, Chair French, there's no one waiting in the waiting room. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, we'll move on to item five, review and approval of the minutes from April the 14th meeting and the special meeting on May the 11th. I believe we approved the April 14th meeting at the special meeting, didn't we? Chair French, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, you deferred the April 14th minutes to this meeting. You approved two other minutes, but deferred the April 14th to this meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. And with that, before I ask for um, of that, um, I just wanted to say before we make a motion for those minutes, which I have read them and they appear to be uh, accurate in order, there was one on our agenda, there was one small uh, human error. It was a typo. I asked that it be corrected. Um, so if you see one, case number that might be a little different from the draft to this agenda, one that was here. It was because it was a small typo that was caught by the agency. And I just wanted to make that, uh, put that on note that that was taken care of. And with that, can I get approval of the minutes from April 14th and the special meeting on May the 11th? So moved. Second. Ms. Varela, will you call the roll? 
Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, and that motion passed unanimously. Thank you. So let's move on to item number six, report from city departments, APD. And we have Acting Commander Mark Lendavasso. Good evening, Chair French and members of the board. Thanks for having me. Um, here to present the data from the Internal Affairs Professional Standards Office for the month of April. Um, and you all were provided a copy of this document. However, I'll go over them. Um, for the month of April 2020, 2022, we had 26 internal cases closed out within Internal Affairs Professional Standards. Um, 16 of those cases were sent out to the area command. Uh, 16 of those cases were completed at the area command level. Opening cases this month, uh, 26 cases were opened um, with internal affairs um, and 28 were went out to the area command. That is a jump in our typical number. Um, we had a violation reference, um, an administrative function in which uh, made that number go up this, this, uh, this, mo this month. Um, total number of pending IE cases for the month is 27 and we had zero cases mediated. And I can answer any questions if you all have any. I don't have any to, are there any questions? All right, then we'll move on to the next item. Uh, number two, IA force. And that is uh, Commander Richard Evans, who is up doing it? Yes, Anthony Mays, Commander uh, Mays, go ahead. Good afternoon, you're stuck with me again. Um, actually, Commander Evans is at the uh, at the range today. So, um, I, uh, I I actually briefly discussing the the SOP. Um, we received um, on April fifteenth um, the recommended changes from the CPOA board uh, for uh, SOP uh, sections two fifty two through two fifty seven. Uh, since then, we've met um, to, get, to discuss those changes and and review and resolve. Um, some of those recommendations. Um, we'll be meeting again tomorrow um, afternoon um, to, to complete the final uh, wrap-ups of the drafts. Um, and, uh, and, I, and then finally, we'll be forwarding that over to the policy and procedures unit, uh, policy manager, manager to request the legal to submit um, the drafts for the six SOP to uh, DOJ and the independent uh, monitoring um, to begin their review. And that's where we're at on that. And um, let's see here, I have, we had a calls for service for April. And again, I'm kind of new at this. So um, I was told we have, uh, we had 44,082 calls for service. And as you can see here with our, um, our stats for the month of April, um, we had, uh, you can see more of the heavier calls definitely dealing with the total of 19 in, in the Northeast. Um, level twos um, were probably the most, what we're seeing the most of, of course is 34, but a total of 58. We're also in the process, um, we actually brought on four new investigators, just so everyone's aware, uh, four new mm -hmm. civilian investigators. And uh, I just hired uh, two additional that will be starting in a couple of weeks that'll be assisting us with um, these investigations. Commander, I have a, Chief, I have a question for you. Back to your uh, number one, is that typical for Northeast to be second? I know it's usually Southeast is usually top, but is that is that typical for Northeast on the level one to come in second? Um, it is not, um, but for some reason we have uh, we've seen an increase, um, definitely of incidents happening. Um, I pers I, what I have seen is more um, we're seeing a lot more of robberies or uh, also known as shoplifting, where they become violent. So we've seen an increase of that. And um, as we all know, most of the malls are in the uh, Northeast Area Command. So um, that could explain those numbers there. Yeah, it looks like Northeast was very busy this month. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Diane or Katrina, you could go ahead and scroll down. I just was looking at that one.
And as you can see, yes, the uh, the numbers are are substantially high. I mean, of course, with the family disputes, definitely go up during the summertime. And we 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 all know we've seen an increase. And in, um, again, with the hot weather and the, and the tension and everything, um, we've seen an increase in family dis disputes in April. And um, I imagine we'll consider seeing we'll continue seeing these numbers kind of high for the next three to four months at least. Aggravated batteries, disturbances. Um, I know the shoplifting number looks low there, but unfortunately we are seeing an increase of that. And, and again, with um, it seems like the shoplifters are getting a lot more violent than we've ever seen in the past. So those numbers have increased considerably. And again, uh, this is the uh, the twelve month uh, force of data, and you see the difference in in some of the areas. Uh, um, definitely, some of the changes. April, um, again, as as we see the, the and as you can see there with not in the northeast again, um, April uh, substantially higher than uh, than foothills, and then uh, right behind that is of course the southeast, um, and then and then. The numbers, are, of course, are going down from there. And then you see there with 12 month graph, um, April again for um, uh, 58. So uh, come down. I mean, we we did come down by one, but as I mentioned, um, if you look at uh, from last year, um, for for example, May of 2021, we had 80. So again, as it starts to get warmer outside and um, you know, we see an increase in, in crime. It's just it's always been like that. So, and you'll see that reflective in these numbers. And thank you for having this up. I appreciate, appreciate you having this up for me. Thank you. And next we have um, on the agenda is uh, 6B, City Council. Mr. Sylvan. Good evening, Board um, Honorable Chair French. Um, Chris Sylvan, Albuquerque City Council. Um, my report's going to be really, really brief tonight. Um, we um, had the budget meeting on um, Monday of this week, and the budget passed and everything. So. We're done with that. Um, the two items that um, were of concern to this board, um, the withdrawal of one of the applicants to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board, um, that one was withdrawn. And the other item was amending the um, oversight ordinance, giving time for members to complete their training. That passed Council 9-0. Um, on the letter of introduction, we had Two individuals, um, I believe one is joining us tonight. Um, their legislation has been put forward and their names will be voted on, sorry, legislation will be voted on, on June 6th. And with that, I stand for questions. Any questions? I don't see any. All right, Mr. Sylvan, you're on again. All right. Um, Public safety, we have not had a public safety meeting, I believe, since March. So there's nothing to report for the public safety part of this agenda. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you very Thank you. much. And we'll move on to the mayor's office. Pastor Walker. Uh, Honorable Chair uh, Carlos Pacheco with uh, City Legal. Uh, I uh, was contacted by Pastor Walker. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend today because of other obligations. Uh, he didn't really have uh, much to report, but uh, except that uh, as the board may know, uh, the appointment of the uh, superintendent of reform was withdrawn and so the search will uh, resume. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pacheco. We'll move on to city attorney. Um, and uh, that'll bring me uh, to the next items, I suppose. Um, not, not much uh, 
beyond uh, our regular work as far as the uh, the, the MOU with APOA that's uh, later on in the agenda. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's about all I have for tonight. I, I don't know if uh, there are any questions from the board though. Are there any questions? If not, then we'll move on. Uh, CPC, uh, Mr. Minza has already contacted me. He and I think Montisa is here. I don't know if she planned on giving the report or not, but I had told them it wasn't necessary. I'm not sure. Diane, could you let me know, was she going to give it or not? I had told him it was not necessary. We can, he can give his report next month and he gave a written report. Uh, Martisa is online, um, but I know she's a little under the weather, so I'm not sure if she's up for it. I'll let her speak if she is. Uh, hi, this is Martisa. Uh, I can go ahead and do the, the report right now, if that's fine. Okay, is your camera working, Martisa? Um, I can't have my camera on right now okay. uh, due to medical reasons. Okay, then go ahead. Okay, so our first one is we did an hour long presentation and questions and answer session at the Four Hills Neighborhood Association meeting with Adalia uh, Luchega Tenya, who is the vice council chair, to explain the CPC to about 20 residents. Uh, we did attend the APD block captains biannual meeting and it, we did set up a table attempting to get new members. Uh, we planned for our first hybrid meeting, which is tonight for the Southeast. So they're expecting about 30 in their, um, in their room. Uh, they have planned for tomorrow's council chairs retreat. It's a meeting of the chairs to discuss the progress and second half of the year plans for the CPC. Uh, there is a planned council training with Steve Brickman. He is coming here for the weekend. Uh, it's a three hour training planned on Saturday morning involving ex chairs, council members, and the CPOA director and uh, Steve Brickman. Uh, we also have a schedule our summer kickoff meeting for all chairs to meet their area commanders and each other on Saturday night at the Albuquerque meeting. And then Kelly is being interviewed on Monday on the Wings of Life podcast by Ann Edenfield. I'll be taking part in a panel discussion on Wednesday with the AEBC Prevent Community Coalition. Um, now we did lose three members this month and have appointed Wanda Harrison as the new chair of the Southwest Council. Thank you, Martisa. Um, are there any questions? If not, uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And then our next one is APOA. I did put APOA on the agenda because I wanna make sure we always give them an opportunity if they want, need to address the board or have anything to report. And I don't believe uh, any of them are here tonight, but um, if they do decide to come, they will have a spot on the agenda. With that, uh, we'll move on uh, to Ms. McDermott, the report, CPOA report. Thank you, Chair French. Um, we opened 40 CPCs since the day of the last meeting of 414. We received information on 19 driving complaints since the date of the last meeting, and these predominantly came from 311. We closed 14 CPCs, which were on the agenda. The board was provided with the complaints and the findings letter for its information. There were no sustained this particular month. As Mr. Sullivan had said on April 28th, the city council's committee of the whole reviewed the budget presentations and information. Um, there were no questions for the CPOA regarding that uh, specific item when that came up. Uh, in order to plan for the APD meeting with the amici regarding the IMR report, um, I had mentioned this a couple of different times, and we're now to the point where I have to have a date to provide to them. So the two choices are June 21st from 10.15 to 11.15, or June 23rd, 1.30 to 2.30. A motion isn't needed, I just needed to know what the board's preference was. So if you could let me know that now so that we don't forget and move away because <laughs> I know that's something that we've been talking about. Give us those dates and times again, please, Diane. June 21st, 
June 21st, 1015 to 1115, or June 23rd, 130 to 230. Usually when it's in the evening, that's an easier selection because I know most, you know, work, but since they have these both in the middle of the day, I really didn't know what worked better for most of the members. You're on mute, Ms. French. Member Nixon and Member Crawford, I'm going to ask you first because both of you uh, have daytime jobs and we will work around your schedules. Yeah, I have a, a mild preference for the 23rd at 1.30, but either one is workable for me. It would have to be after three for me. Yeah, unfortunately, at least to my knowledge, there isn't flexibility, at least that's what I've been told, so. Diane, are these meetings recorded? So if member Nixon wants to listen at a later time, he has the opportunity to? You know, since these are APD meetings, I'm not 100% sure. I can certainly record them, assuming that I'm allowed to record them. So I'll have to inquire that. Okay. Because we do have to find workarounds for those individuals that can't get off in the middle of the day. Understood. So okay. is it the Thank 23rd then that we're going to go with? Uh, that works for me, Member Wartell. Anything works for me, I'll make it work. Okay, okay great. And uh, the second, I'll, I'll move on if that's all right. The second half of the semi-annual CPOA report is now up on SharePoint for the board's review. So you'll uh, go ahead and have this time and then you can review it. Uh, so by June uh, meeting, if you'll approve it, then it'll be forwarded on to the city council. Uh, the next monitor site visit is going to be the week of June 6th through the 10th, and that's to discuss the results of IMR 15 and just go over the, the various things that they do on the site visits. Uh, the, as Mr. Sylvan had already reported, that the city council originally had a prospective board member, but that was withdrawn on May 16th and that the um, ordinance has been revised, although it is not official yet, it has to be finalized through that same process as the uh, original amendments to the ordinance. So, but once it is, we'll, we'll let you all know, but it has been um, provided so far. And uh, of course, also, uh, as I've been reminded, the IMR uh, site visit is, or IMT site visit, excuse me, is also the gather data for the current period that we're in right now, IMR 16. So um, with that general report, um, I don't have any more if you have any questions. And then I know there were some sub, topics to move on to. I do have, Excuse oh, I'm me. sorry, go ahead, Member Wartell. With respect to the budget that City Council passed, how does that affect CPOA? Uh, so we did ask for some increases uh, to cover things like the translation services. Uh, we also asked for uh, increases to do mediation. So. Our intended plan is to have direct access to a mediation contractor so that we can send cases to mediation instead of having to go through a go-between for, um, previously it was using the alternative dispute resolution through the city and that kind of just didn't work out that well. So we're gonna try and have a better mediation program through a direct contract type of situation. Uh, that will require a suspension of one of the paragraphs of the CASA, the number escapes me right now, but um, that is usually well received. I know in the IMR that was encouraged to happen, so I don't expect any issues with that. And the other uh, budget item was that the CPCs themselves were um, given more funds to be able to do some of the things that they need to do. And then there was also a, an additional position added to the uh, agency so that we would be able to better do the work that we need to do. What was the overall percentage increase of the budget? Uh, that I don't actually have. I don't know. Can you get that, please? Uh, sure. 
Uh, Diane, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, the report that you said that we can see is on the share drive. Uh, I never, there's nothing on the share drive. Once you take all your classes like I did or whatever, there's no reason for us to get in on the share drive very often. Can you make that more accessible to the board members than us having to log on to a different drive? Because I really don't get, there's no need to get in there too much anymore. I can resend the link for SharePoint because it, I believe it's too large to send via email, um, but I can try one way or the other. I'll send you a link or um, have it through an email if I can send it that way. Okay, that would be helpful. <clears throat> and also Diane, if there's anything that you brought up that wasn't in your document that you sent to us in your report, will you send us an amended document? I like to track the things that we talked about. So I know sometimes you said I said it verbally, but it wasn't in my report. So if it is, if there is something that's on not in your report, just amend it and send a, a new version, okay? Would you please? Okay. Yeah, I okay. think in this one, it was just the change that had happened at city council that I you know, had attended on Monday, but that's fine, yes, that's fine. Okay, all right, thank you. So we'll go on to the, the next ones, the uh, staffing study. Okay, so um, the information that we have thus far is that uh, Katrina had reached out to H city HR and requested some information as you know, city HR does these sorts of studies. They did not actually have any in-house uh, group that does this and they did not have any specific resource. Um, then we went ahead to um, the APD chief's office since they had mentioned in their report that at a city council meeting that a staffing study had been conducted. So the chief of staff and uh, another chief's office employee had referred us to purchasing. So we received a list of vendors from them. Um, also Katrina reached out to another person in APD in their records department because they had had a staffing study. Uh, it was before her time. So she was gonna research that, but she hadn't had a chance to get back to us on that one yet. So we reached out to purchasing and the senior buyer and we received two vendors names and we have Alexander Weiss and IXP Corporation. We've reached out to both of those vendors. We received a response from one of them. That contact at IXP had said that his division only handles communications and 911 type of operations, but that they were gonna go ahead and reach out to, I guess their corporate to see if they had someone else available to assist. And we have not heard yet back from them. And then the other company, like I said, uh, we have not heard from yet, but that is the company that APD had used for their staffing study. It's the Alexander Weiss. So at this moment, we have made the reach outs and the attempts, and we're just kind of waiting to get information back from these sources. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just say that at my, and I knew the city may not have anybody. I knew about this I think I was still in records years ago or when they did that staffing study. And so that's why it was, I thought it was pretty clear in my motion. I wanted three vendors and the cost. Uh, they didn't, because I know, I know that we might have to go through city council because of the cost. I know there's a procurement policy procedure. I know all of that. And so um, I, I appreciate you reading to me out the city, but I, my motion was to three vendors, not, they don't have to be within the city. I just wanted three vendors and the cost so we'll know our next step. Because and like we I did said- reach, Sorry, not to interrupt you, but we no, did reach ahead. out to the two vendors that are on contract with the city to try and get that information because there's always the uh, preference and instruction to go with organizations that are already on contract with the city. So if we could get the information from them to find out to do this, that would be the direction that we're supposed to go with. If we go outside of entities that have don't have contracts with the city, then that is a, a much different process. And I know, that's why I said bring back three. And like I said, I know that the it's best to use the ones that are on contract, but obviously we didn't get a feedback. We didn't get the information we needed to move forward with this. And so that's why I'm saying, I understand why you did what you did, but I'm saying that we need to think outside the box here 
and bring us three minimum. And I think I went back and read my motion again. It was a minimum of three vendors if you with the cost. And like you said, it might be a total different process. I'd love to get the ones that have a contract with the city, but if we can't, we can't stop there. So we need to move forward with the staffing study. So please have those uh, vendors if at to our next meeting. Uh, we can try um, since the next meeting is a fairly short turnaround. I'm not sure if we'll have it that advanced, but we can try and see what we need to do. Okay, next item. <clears throat> the uh, IMR 15. Um, the reason that I have it on there, and Diane, I'll let you talk afterwards. Uh, the reason I put it on there is because I, I, I hope uh, board members had an opportunity to read this. If you didn't, uh, please review it. I think ours starts at, on page about 304 <laughs> in the IMR, and it's 10, 11 pages. There were some um, uh, non-compliance. Um, and so uh, on those issues, I'd like for the agency uh, to get back with us on the, the, like I said, four out of 10 cases uh, that they reviewed were in non-compliance. So, um, so that this won't happen again and we won't be found non-compliance on any issues, I'd like the agency to report back to us on what they're gonna do to improve this and make sure it doesn't happen again. I just wanna know uh, what your plan and strategy is, tactics are to uh, improve on that. And as so, the board, we need to read that. And because uh, we gave Mr. Crawford, Member Crawford, the authority to respond. So we need to be specific. And so we need to know what we want him to respond on. And I'm sorry, Diane, go ahead. That's right. Um, so some of the concerns and criticisms that were highlighted in the IMR actually had not been expectations brought forth before. Um, since the draft had come out, I have taken the information from the draft and provided it to the investigators during our last training meeting. So a lot of those things um, we're moving forward to fix some of the minor documentation type of things. Um, the monitor had made some modifications to the draft based on the comments that I had provided. Um, some of the other clarifications are going to have to occur during the site visit um, for some technical assistance and try and uh, get some understanding with a couple of the things. That's fine, Matt. I'm just asking uh, what your plans are and to report back to the board. And I, you, I understand you might have to meet with them, but to ensure it just doesn't happen again, I'm not trying to throw blame or anything. All we can do is move forward and try to correct <clears throat> anything that they found that was done incorrect. So that's all I meant. And we just need to uh, do that moving forward. And the board also needs to look at everything. That was my concern there. Okay. And the next item that I had, and I had a um, couple of citizens to reach out to me about the protest investigation because I believe that our previous executive director had reported to city council that it was hundreds and hundreds, I think he said one was 500, one was 300 hours of lapel camera, and that uh, they wanted to know had we looked into that and what we had done about it. And so it was before my time. So I asked our interim director to give me some information about those uh, protest investigations. So Diane, with that, would you just, um, for the record, uh, let people know what you told me, just, just to be transparent on those investigations. Sure. Um, CPC 157 had many hours of review of video before it was determined that it should actually be transferred to Internal Affairs Force Division due to their ongoing investigation. This and a CPC 15920 were actually involving crossover information. In discussions with the IAFD at the time, it was determined that they would be taking portion of it, the 157 portion, 20 portion, and the rest would remain under 15920. Um, a significant amount of work had already gone into the 15720 portion, but it was still necessary for many of the parts of the 159 portion. I know that sounds confusing, but it's the best way I can explain it to you. Um, in reviewing the CPC 15720 IAFD closed our invest the CPC portion of it because it is duplicative, which is standard, as it was investigated under several different force case numbers. 
um, let's see, since there were multiple subjects involved. One of the force case numbers, which would be an F2020-409, uh, uh, would look like it was a level three, which usually means that the board will review it. However, when I reached out to the person in charge of the FRB, they were researching it and trying to locate its, whether it had been presented at FRB or not, it did not appear that it had been, but they're still re researching that. So as soon as why I have more information about that, I can update that. Um, in terms of the 159, which I just mentioned, that also involved the, the numbers of hours, and it was connected to the other event. Uh, it did cross over into additional days. This was an event that sort of actually spanned a few different days. The case focused on the arrest of a particular individual that was at a protest and then arrest, arrested later. A subpoena was issued for probation and parole employees to provide some important information. There were several delays actually created by probation and parole, almost a year actually, and ultimately they never responded. Uh, independent legal counsel, Tina Gooch, uh, the director at the time, and myself were all trying to get a response from this entity. And uh, I know former director Harness had advised the board on, on this information in the past. Uh, ultimately, uh, Ms. Gooch issued a memo in November of 2021 to basically say that it wasn't a legal battle worth fighting to get them to cooperate. So the case does need to be completed with the information obtained. Um, this, of course, came right at the same time that I started serving as interim. So as soon as I am able to write that up, that will be done. Most of the work has been done, but there is still some organization and some write-up that needs to occur on this. And then the final one is uh, 15820, which involved uh, several hours of video as well, that it was assigned to an investigator that's no longer with the agency. I've done an initial look at what has been done. Um, it does appear that there's a force investigation that will overlap the issues that would be addressed in the complaint. But I do have to ensure that everything that was in the complaint would be addressed by the force. The force investigation does appear to be part of their force backlog. So that's kind of the status of that one at this point that it has to be compared to see which one's gonna, I presume ours will probably be closed as duplicative, but I just have to verify that everything is actually covered uh, in those two processes. So that was the status of those things. It's unfortunately a multitude of problems that created at the time such as COVID, no staff, no equipment to work remotely efficiently, the videos having to be downloaded through VPN, um, and then the duplicate efforts of just kind of the chaos of the, the summer and things like that. Thank you, because that, that is does seem to be a few citizens' concerns. So please keep us updated on that, um, on those cases, will you? I know you said you're moving them forward, but just in case I forget to put them back on the agenda, put it, make it part of your... Uh, a report if you if anything any change changes okay thank you Diane. yeah I, I assume that the next stage would really be that once they're ready for the board's you know information and review but depending on how long that's going to be I certainly can give a an intermediate uh, update okay I would appreciate that thank you so <clears throat> that's all of the uh, item number six let's move on there was no item number seven there were no requests for reconsideration so we'll move on to item number eight, the non-concurrence. Um, Interim Director McDermott, did any of APD, I know you had last update, there weren't one person was here to represent on one case and we can do that first, but did they ever respond to have somebody else uh, uh, speak on the other cases? So Chair French, two of the cases uh, will need to be tabled for next month, which is the 191-21 and 202-21. But uh, we do have representatives here for 214 and 248. Um, I believe Erica Wilson, Communications Director, is here for 214 and Commander uh, Weber is here for 248. OK, well, Diane, I'll let you go with um your uh, reports, and then I will let them respond concerning uh, their non-concurrence with your with the agency's report. Okay. Um, so 214, uh, if that's the one we're going to go to first, 
So there's, there's two policies that the agency had identified as being an issue with this particular case. 1-1-5A4, uh, which was used to deal with the allegation that the operator yelled, scolded, and hung up on the complainant. This was exonerated because the event occurred, meaning that the operator did not yell, scold, or hang up on the complainant, but there was a call that actually occurred. And the uh, complainant, we didn't want to discount the fact that a call um, had occurred. So uh, that was the SOP that we used to address that particular issue. And it was felt that that SOP was the better fit because it included the wording of obtain information. Um, the other policy that we utilized was 2-1-10-D4A. Uh, and that was to use to deal with the allegation that the operator failed to create a call for service after collecting information from the complainant who alleged the individual, uh, he was being, um, sorry, I'm getting a little confused with myself, who alleged an individual with a machete was chasing him. So this was sustained because no event was created and obviously one should have been, the operator had admitted that one should have been, it should have been a priority one call. Uh, the department, I understand, administratively, administratively closed this violation because it was duplicative of 1-1-5A4. So there's some discussion there that obviously Ms. Wilson will, will provide to you as well. So there's discussion about how the SOPs were treated. And then the other issue being a uh, discipline disagreement or, or non-concurrence. The department said a, a written reprimand was appropriate. Originally, um, I had a higher level sanction uh, belief that the SOP appropriate would have been a higher level of discipline. Um, since they utilized the SOP that they wanted to, you know, I can get behind that. But my opinion is still that the written reprimand is probably too um, minor, I guess you'd say, uh, discipline, and that I would revise it to an eight-hour suspension. Uh, and then I'm sure Ms. Wilson can provide her insight. Ms. Wilson? Chairman French and board members, thank you for allowing me to appear. Um, what had occurred in this instance um, was we utilized the conduct SOP as it had a sanction assigned to it. And the conduct SOP states that they'll obtain information in a professional prompt and courteous manner and then act upon it in a proper and judicious manner within the scope of their duties. This employee did not, she had no prior discipline and um, that's why a written reprimand ultimately was the discipline imposed. The, uh, I actually held the hearing with the employee and we had a lengthy conversation about expectations and appropriate performance and that every call needs to be screened and handled appropriately. She has not done this. She's got several years of experience on and this, we had a conversation about um, not um, bringing in biases or allowing somebody to uh, push buttons for lack of a better term. The other comment that the CPOA uh, unit brought forward to us, which was very valid, is that our SOP for communications proper is quite dated. And we have since then submitted a new and updated policy. It's in process now. It's been uh, reviewed and passed by the board. So we hope to have that policy in place but we do tend to use the conduct policy as they have more pointed, um, specific, um, well, not specific, but more global override to uh, performance issues. So Ms. Wilson, are you saying that once you interviewed them and, and the reason that you didn't concur is because you used a different code of sanctions. You used a different SOP violation. I'm not really clear on why, you know, I heard what the agency said, you know, she could change it a little bit, but, you know, we all know there's a code of sanctions based on um, the violation and the times that it occurred. So could you 
clear that up for me on why, on what you use that they didn't or vice versa. What they used, which was reasonable, and I understand why, was the communications SOP, which talked about handling a call and entering it appropriately, but there were no sanctions assigned to it. So that's why I then um, recommended that we use the conduct SOP and charger. While it said really the somewhat the same aspect of it, it had a sanction assigned to it and I felt would have more teeth. So we were really in agreement. We were going after the same point of, no, the call wasn't handled appropriately. It's not how we want to do business. And we addressed it with the employee who had not had any previous violations. So you applied the code of sanctions that went along with that SOP violation? Correct. Okay, okay. All right. And Chair French, if I may. Sure. Uh, and just in general, uh, you know, for the board's edification, the public's edification, the, the SOPs for APD, there are oftentimes multiple crossovers. You could pick one, you could pick another. It's sort of just a way of looking at it. So some of these non-concurrences that you are experiencing or seeing is kind of that. The, the chain is looking at it one way. We looked at it a slightly different way. So it all kind of tends to get to the, the same idea in most cases. It's just kind of how we get there. So it's just something to, to be aware of that it's usually not that one party is totally wrong or right or just disagreeing with one or the other. It's just sort of different ways of approaching it and looking at it. So, and that would be the case for this one, I would say in most pretty much. Okay. Are there any questions by the board? If not, well, thank you, Ms. Wilson, for coming tonight and speaking on this. Thank you, and thanks to the board. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, Diane, 24821. Uh, yes, Chair French. So in this case, uh, this is strictly a discipline non-concurrence. Uh, the department was in agreement with both the SOP and the um, finding of that. What we had said was that there were two violations, two SOPs in question here, and we had issued or recommended an issuing of a written reprimand for each one of those since they were separate issues. Um, the department went with a written reprimand for the one, but felt that a, a non-disciplinary corrective action was appropriate for the other, which is still in the realm, but um, obviously Commander Weber can explain further their logic on that. Officer Weber. You're on mute, sir. Excuse me, uh, Commander Weber for AP. Um, Chair French and other members, thank you uh, for having me and I appreciate the transparency that this brings if there's a non-concurrence. Um, and as Diane explained, there's really not a disagreement about policy. I found that both violations were sustained. The difference is simply in how we believe it should have been handled. One, um, the OBRD violation, we agreed a written reprimand was appropriate based on the policy violation and the officer's record. The other violation, which was a, um, a conduct issue with the perception that the officer, or actually it's not an officer, it's a police service aide, was being um, a little bit rude to a civilian by re-engaging this person. Just a little background, the, the particular call, the, the PSA was assisting a citizen when, when another party at a neighboring gas station where we've had some issues with um, criminal activity, the, um, the, the service aide noticed that she was being what she described as kind of stared at in an uncomfortable way by an individual there. That individual did um, initiate contact with her um, by way of being, um, I guess, yelling at her from where he was at. She initially ignored it and then uh, I guess felt like he continued to stare at her. So she actually yelled back to him, you know, why can I help you with something? Ultimately, what the investigation showed was that she really didn't need to re-engage him. Um, my feeling on it was this is a young female. Um, 
and she says this in her own statement, these are not my words, but this is a young female uh, working in a pretty rough area of town. She felt like she needed to establish some presence on what she thought was just an inappropriate being stared at by this, by this guy who was there. Um, and I think that it could have been handled better, but I also think the way to correct that behavior was for her to meet with um, one of our veteran supervisors and have him kind of go over with her how she can establish presence without being rude about it um, and kind of in making decisions to engage or not to engage. Um, so, you know, I, I agreed the policy was violated, but I didn't feel on that second violation that another reprimand, uh, I could have given her another reprimand for that, but for me, um, the corrective action of having her get counseled on, you know, just kind of some street presence uh, from a seasoned supervisor. To me, that's what was gonna correct the issue and prevent it from happening again. So that's what I recommended. And I, I guess the chief's office went with that recommendation, which is why we're here. And Chair Fridge. Yes, go ahead, Ms. McDermott, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, so just to give again, some information about how the, the discipline process works, at least for us, is the instruction that I've had or that I understand from the policy is that I go with the presumptive, but then the department has the benefit of knowing the history a little more. I see the history, but not like the nuanced history, if you will. And they have the opportunity to go through the pre-disciplinary hearing and hear you know, the information from the employee so it can modify it within a range. So you will see uh, sometimes those disagreements as you have with these non-concurrences, as long as they're within that spectrum of that particular violation, that is you know, within the prerogative of the department and it's not um, unreasonable. And that's just why you'll start seeing that though, is I tend to go with the presumptive unless there is something clear in the case that's uh, mitigating or aggravating. And then the department has the fuller spectrum of the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. Well, I'm for my small comments on this whole issue. Um, I I agree with Commander Weber because I've known him for years. I agree that uh, you know maybe another letter would not have done it, but to have her sit down, go to mediation, and correct her ac actions and be told what she did or didn't do correctly is probably the best. Uh, that one on one here's what you did wrong, don't do it again. And two letters, I don't think would have, would have done that. So um, I, I agree, Diane, they have more, they have the authority to do that. And in this case, um, I would have to say, I don't see a problem with that either. So not that we have a vote or a voice commander, but I would say that, yes, I think that's a good way to go because we all know with discipline is to correct behavior. And that, that was a correct about action, so. <clears throat> As long as Ms. McDermott agrees, I, I, I don't see any reason to uh, belabor this one at all. Are there any questions from the board? Member Wartell. What is our responsibility in this case? In either case for that matter. None, they just bring back the non-concurrence to us and say, this is the agency's findings. APD did not agree with us. That's all. And the, usually Diane just presented um, hers and then the, and said the agency didn't concur and would tell why. I asked for the agency to be here because I just wanted a little more e explanation and to be available to answer questions. But we have no vote, no voice in this other than to say, why didn't you concur? I, mm -hmm. I guess we could send a letter to the chief, but. Diane, maybe you could um, elaborate on that. I don't know that there's a follow-up process, to be honest, because um, it's changed in various ways. Um, so once the board hears it, it's for your information, for transparency, for the, both the public as well as the board. Um, these things are captured in the uh, semi-annual reports, we do track all of that information there. Um, but as to a direct response from the board to the department regarding it, 
Um, I, I don't know that it's necessary unless there is some egregious one that you feel is worth noting in that way. But there's no formal role is what you're saying to me. Not that I'm thinking of at the moment, no. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're on mute, Chair French. Oh, I just said, thank you, Commander Weber. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate the explanation. Nice to see you again, Patty. Thanks, same to you. Bye. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then um, we're going to use, we're going to do our um, serious use of force. And then if everyone doesn't mind. Um, but, yes. Uh, were you going to table 19121 and 20221 to the next meeting? Yes. So um, I think that has to come in a form of a motion, correct? A motion to table. So I would like to make a motion to table 191.21 and 202.21. And I don't believe I have to say it until our next meeting, as long as I'm just tabling it, it automatically goes on the next month's meeting, correct? So I made the motion, is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Member Varela, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Uh, yes. Thank you. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Would it be possible for me to just, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I had an item that was maybe for discussion on that motion, although I don't know that would have changed my vote. Well, we have, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't say it, was there any discussion? I'm sorry, Jesse, but go ahead. I'm just a little concerned, you know, most of these non-concurrences are, I would say, fairly technical in nature, like the, the outcome that APD selected was not radically different from, from what the agency recommended. I think it's usually reasonably easy for us to understand. So I'm just, I'm a little concerned that I don't know that it's a good use of our time or the time of APD personnel to, um, you know, ask for someone from APD to be present for some of these non-concurrences that are reasonably straightforward. I don't know that I have an action to propose right now. I just think maybe we should think about uh, a little different approach of maybe asking for someone for from APD to represent the issue, you know, if we have questions about it that are substantial, but kind of not, not otherwise. Okay. We can certainly open that discussion at one of the subcommittee meetings on what we want and what we don't. Uh, that would be fine with me. Okay, Member Crawford. Member Wartell? Well, going along with what Member Crawford said, uh, why can't we put these into the consent agenda? And if there's an egregious disagreement, that's the time to pull them out and ask for representation, and, you know, and ask for an explanation. Because as you pointed out, we really have no role here. Is that that's, an unreasonable thing to do? That's fine. I am the one that requested that APD be here because on some of our other non-concurrence, they cited court law. It was pertaining to an officer and uh, pertaining to a DWI. And I had several questions and there was nobody here to uh, answer those questions. So I was the one that said um, that I would like to have APD here to answer questions, but that might be a better way to do it just on the ones that we have questions on. We ask them to come for those, that's, that's fine too. Uh, it's the first time we've done it, so I'm certainly opening to streamlining it, and I'm open to the board um, discussion and opinions on this. So uh, we definitely. Think, do that. Am I agreeing with you, Member Crawford? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll briefly respond. Perhaps so. Yeah, it's just you know this was just a change of procedure basically from the last meeting to ask someone from APD to be present, and I don't. I like the idea of being able to ask questions on these. I just feel bad, um, you know, having APD personnel spend their time in the evening 
uh, when I think often on these non-concurrences, there's not really that much discussion about them. Sure, I, I'm, I think I'm violently agreeing with you. Okay, it's fine with me and we'll, we'll do that on the next uh, ones. We'll pull the non-concurrence that we feel like we want answers on and then we'll ask only on those cases if, you, if everyone agrees. Doesn't mean we have to put them on the consent agenda. Diane can still present them. We can just, uh, if there's any questions or we want uh, APD to answer any, we can ask only for those particular non-concurrent cases. Is that, uh, Member Nixon? Yeah, I agree with uh, Mike and uh, Jesse on this from the standpoint as, as long as we can look at what we need to, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm looking for loss of life and injury to the public and those kind of things to, 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 to is, is more of an interest. If everybody's alive and no one's hurt, I'm feeling good about that. <laughs> That's kind of a relief, but um, I think that it's a good idea for us to be able to have that discretion and spend our time a little bit more wisely. Thank you. All right. Then uh, it appears that um, my idea will be uh, removed and we will just uh, go back to our norm. Your idea is good. It just doesn't have to be blanket. No, 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 I understand. But I'm just saying you're right. It's better use of our time. We have no role in this. And only if we there's something egregious that we want to stand out should we do that. So I'm agreeing. And, and, and thank you guys for that. Um, because this was the first time. And you're right. We could have spent a better time and so could they have on those small issues. So thank you very much for the board's input. I really do appreciate it. And so with that, we'll move on. And I was going to ask the board after we do the serious use of force cases, um, we will take a break. Is everyone in agreement with that? Or did somebody want to take one now? Or did you prefer we wait till after that? Member Crawford. That's good. Okay. All right. Is everybody in agreement? Okay. Let's move on with item nine. Diane? Uh, yes, Chair French. I wasn't sure exactly how you wanted to tackle this. Uh, I know the, the board uh, members in the past have you know, expressed that they didn't want to go through a, a, a laborious review of the situation. Uh, so what I can do is the sort of preliminary letter that I had written, I can go over that for the public's benefit. And uh, the board, although the board had reviewed the uh, PowerPoint, uh, which contains some video snippets as well as the minutes from the FRB. Um, but as the uh, interim director, I did attend this particular FRB, sorry, going on to 21 0063380. That's uh, IA Force Case uh, F21 uh, 511. And in review of this, in preparation for the FRB, reviewed the computer-aided dispatch reports, the criminalistics reports, which consist of the crime scene photos, the use of force narratives, which is primarily the officer interviews, um, the, the written portion of that, the internal affairs force division reports, which consists of the actual report, as well as a supervisor review and a commander review, on body recording device videos, um, the overall policy, the use of force policy, uh, and then attending the force review board briefing on 113.22, which consists of the same PowerPoint presentation that the uh, board had the benefit of, of viewing. So the, the very brief facts is that on August 12th of 2021, Mr. O was intoxicated and caused a disturbance at a hotel. Mr. O disturbed several individuals, fought with individuals and allegedly attempted to strike an individual with a car. As a result, the police were called, officers investigated the situation and determined there was probable cause to arrest Mr. O. Officers one and two utilized low level control tactics on numerous occasions to overcome minimal resistance. Mr. O initially cooperated, but then offered passive resistance. At the police vehicle, Mr. O refused to get inside. He then became agitated and hit his head on the police car, actually causing a dent on the vehicle. So the officers moved him away to prevent further injury to himself or damage. The types of force that were used in this situation was a level three empty hand takedown on a handcuffed subject, 
Mr. O attempted to trip officers and Mr. O struggled with officers, so he was put on the ground. Uh, based on the review of the materials and the information that was presented at FRB, both the FRB and myself found that the use of force by officers one and two were within policy. The another use of force was a level one resisted handcuffing. Once he was in handcuffs on the ground, Mr. O continued to struggle. Officer two prevented Mr. O from kicking and officer two presented, applied a press, which is a passive restraint system to Mr. O. And again, the FRB and myself found the use of force by officers one and two were within policy. And then the specific policies that are identified as part of this investigation is 2-52-4E1. When force is used, the decision to use force and the level of force must be reasonable, necessary, and proportional given the totality of the circumstances. Again, the use of force was within policy. 2-52-4E2, factors defining the totality of circumstances include but are not limited to severity of the crime, whether the individual actively resisted arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight, and whether the individual poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or other. And then 253Q1, minimum amount of force necessary, the lowest level of force within the range of objectively reasonable force as it is necessary to make an arrest or achieve a lawful objective without increasing the risk to officers or others. Uh, when we go through the force review board process, another part of it is the discussion of the post use of force. Uh, Mr. O did remain uncooperative throughout the situation and he was assessed by rescue. Um, so I stand for if the board wishes to consider or ask questions. Uh, I think, Diane, that I had expressed, I, I, I received your letter and I've gone back and looked at the way that um, our past director did it. And, and you know, like the CASA says, we need your findings. So I was looking back and looking at his, the CPOA finds officer one's conduct exonerated. Those are his findings. Did you, um, I know you said you were gonna work on it, but did you make it clear your findings? So the way, um, you know, I, I did look at some of the previous examples and it says it was exonerated. Now the way the vote occurs in the force review board is it says it's within policy or out of policy. So I was going with the way that I need to represent it in the, the force review board. They don't, they don't say exonerated, they don't say sustained. It, it's either in policy or out of policy. So that is why I said in the letter here, it was within policy because that is how everything is reflected. And that may be a change back when Director Harness did go, they might used to have said exonerated or you know some of the different things, but the way that the process is now is you're, you're voting both myself and the force review board members, they're saying in policy or out of policy. So that's why I would say that this is more proper to, at least in this newer version of you know difference from whatever it was happening in the past is to say that the use of force with it was within policy and i can change it to say the director says it was used within policy but i want your findings um like i said so we can go over that but i do like i said i'd like to uh, stay within what the casa says and it says that the director will give us findings on each one of these case we can and the find finding is within policy the finding is it was within policy okay on each each one of those right correct so okay so that's what i want noted now if if on on the one that we had where ed did not agree with the FRB or with that findings. And he said he did not concur and his mm -hmm. was different. How would you note that in yours? If My you letter would be that I found it out of policy as an example. Let's just say if they determine, if FRB determined that it was within policy and I found it to be out of policy, I would say my finding on this is out of policy. And then would you make a recommendation on uh, discipline? Because I think we got findings and recommendations. Then if you've got, I don't know if 
you know, I'm just asking, would you, um, as past practice, would you continue to say, I find this out of policy and this is my recommendation? I would, and again, I'm hypothetically guessing at this point, but yes, I would continue to say it was out of policy and then look at the specific SOP that would be at issue and then determine a sanction level on that and recommend whatever is appropriate based on the 3-46 discipline policy. Okay, I just wanna make sure we're on the same page since um, this is the first time that I've seen uh, that letter it done like this on the serious use of force, uh, but this is the first time you've presented any where you participated in FRB. But this is the first time we've changed, kind of changed the way this procedure when I saw this letter, the process. So that's why I'm just trying to get clarification from you that you would give us your findings and your recommendations. If there was a recommendation that could be provided, I mean, you know, again, it, I'd have to look at it case by case specific, but yes, I mean, if there is a recommendation to be made, um, then that would be something that I would, would provide. Uh, this, the FRB discussions that occur where uh, the director is asked for some input, um, sometimes it doesn't rise to a change in a finding, but still there's discussion. So if there was something relevant that uh, came out of that meeting, I would certainly be stating that in the letter as well. Um, like today, there was some discussion on some things that I had an issue with. So um, it, okay. you know, that's just case by case. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, this is a new way of doing things for me too. Um, so I will let you go ahead. We were with that first one. And so you had presented the letter. And so what were your thoughts, um, Interim Director, on, on how we should move forward? If we agree, we don't agree, what are your, we sign this, we, if we have any discussion, is there any discussion on this particular uh, case? In, in the past, of course, the board has pretty much said they agree or disagree with the director. I, um, would assume that the board would actually engage in a little bit more of a discussion if there is discussion to be had on a particular case. And that was my, as you all may have noticed on my draft letter was that I had a section in there that I was going to fill in whatever you may have said during this meeting of the board considered or the board determined if there was any consideration or determination. Um, if the board doesn't have much of an input on this particular case, then I can simply write the sentence saying the board um, concurred with the information provided by the executive or interim executive director. But again, I wanted to make sure that there was something specific that the board wished to convey to the department uh, or observe, then I would add that to this letter. Member Wartel? Wouldn't you imagine um, Ms. McDermott, that in a, it, would, it would be an extremely rare situation where the board would disagree if both you and the FRB agreed? I really can't answer that question. I mean, there is a possibility that the board would observe something differently or think of something differently that is, you know, Part of the purpose of civilian oversight is that you have a different take and a different perspective on things. So it is possible in the review of the materials that something occurs to the board membership that may not have come to. I mean, is it rare? Probably, but I can't say that would never happen, so. Well, I didn't say it would never happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other? Yes, Member Crawford. Yeah, uh, Chair French, I'd like to, to move that the board accept the, the, I guess I'll word it is accept the recommendations of the executive director uh, on this case, whichever it is, the 0063380. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Um, any more discussion? Okay, Member Bar Barilla? Member Crawford? Yes. 
Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, that motion passed unanimously. Would you like me to go on to the next one? I'm so sorry, my mute's on, yes. I okay. said your name and the case number, yes, please proceed. All right. Uh, well, since it was on mute, I'll repeat the case number. It was is 21-0065420. And in this situation, uh, I had reviewed and attended the FRB, the computer-aided dispatch reports, the criminalistic reports, the use of force narratives, the internal affairs reports, the on-body recording videos, the APD use of force policy, and then attending the FRB uh, meeting, which was 1-13-22. The very brief facts of the situation is on August 19th of 2021, Sergeant One observed two individuals loitering. The management had complained of loiterers. Sergeant One requested backup and Officer One arrived, contacting the individuals. One of the individuals was allowed to depart as he had demonstrated he had been conducting business at the establishment. Sergeant One noticed the evidence of paraphernalia in a plain view in Mr. G's backpack. Officer One requested to remove it and he was given the permission and he then located narcotics. As a result, Mr. G was informed he was under arrest. The types of force that were involved in this as a level three empty hand control on a handcuffed subject. During the search incident to arrest, so he'd already been handcuffed at this point. During the search incident to arrest, Mr. G tried to pull free and reach into his pockets. Officer one and Sergeant one grabbed his arm from within his pocket. He denied doing anything, but he clenched something in his hand and officer one was trying to force his hand open. Mr. G tried to conceal the narcotics in his anus and officers physically wrestled with his hands and arms to release what was in his hand and not conceal it. Uh, the force review board and myself determined that the use of force by officer one and Sergeant one were within policy. The next use of force was a level three empty hand takedown on a handcuffed subject. Mr. G raised his leg to kick and officer one and Sergeant one put Mr. G to the ground. Again, the FRB and myself found the use of force by officer one and Sergeant one were within policy. The second and third events uh, of a level three empty hand control on a handcuffed subject, Sergeant one and officer one still struggled with Mr. G's clenched fist to try and get him to release what he held, held while he was on the ground. The uses of force by officer one and Sergeant one were deemed to be within policy. And the specific policies identified regarding this were 2-525C, officers shall use not use force against a restrained or handcuffed individual unless the force is necessary to prevent eminent bodily harm to the officer or another person or persons to overcome active resistance or to move an individual who's passively resisting. And then the other is 2-525A6, the use of leg sweeps, arm bars, or takedowns or a passive restraint system shall only be considered and used in the following circumstances to prevent imminent bodily harm to the officer or another person or persons or to overcome active resistance. Um, also concerned in this is the post use of force and he was assessed by rescue. Are there any questions? If not, do I hear a motion? I move that the board accept the recommendations of the executive director. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Varela, will you call the roll? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. All right. Um, we'll move on to 2172619. All right. Again, uh, I attended the FRB and in part of the reviewing of the materials, it was the computer aided dispatch, the field reports, the criminalistics reports, the use of force narratives, the internal affairs force division reports, the on body recording videos, the policy itself, and then attending the force review board. Uh, the brief facts of the situation are that on September 13th of 2021, officers one and two were dispatched in reference to a disturbance. Ms. F was pulling a fire alarm and breaking lights. There was a restraining order against Ms. F for being at that location. Officer two advised Ms. F that she was under arrest for the violation. Ms. F ran from the officers. However, she then returned and was placed in handcuffs. So the types of force, there were low level control tactics used several times throughout the encounter to guide Ms. F. 
there was a, le a level three empty hand takedown on a handcuffed subject. So once in handcuffs, Miss F took several steps forward and leaned her body back and she sat on the ground, but she used her legs to push herself back up. Officer one grabbed the back of her shirt and pushed her back down and she made a biting motion towards the officer. The use of force by officer one was deemed to be within policy by myself and by the FRB. Level one empty hand control. While she was being escorted, she was uncooperative. And then she wrapped her legs around officer one's legs. She clamped her knee around his leg and refused to release. And officer one pried Miss F's, leg, F's legs apart in order to get his leg released. That use of force by officer one was deemed to be within policy by both the FRB and myself. The specific policies identified regarding this use of force were 2-524A2, the general requirements being when feasible officers shall allow an individual a reasonable amount of time to submit to an arrest or lawful order before using force. 2-525A6, the use of leg sweeps, arm bar, takedowns, or passive restraint shall only be considered and used in the following circumstances to prevent imminent bodily harm or to overcome active resistance. And 2-526A6, a and B, which is the, again, sorry, I'm repeating myself, the use of leg sweeps, um, I have to delete that. So, uh, and that was, that was it, <laughs> sorry. Are there any other questions or anything? Are there any questions from the board? If not, do I hear a motion? Same. Um, I'll second. We have a motion. Uh, thank you, Chair French, but for the re record, it's going to be that someone is motioning to accept the executive director's recommendations. Yes. A motion to accept the executive director's recommendations. Thank you. And that was a second from Crawford? That's correct. Thank you. Member Crawford? Member Crawford? Uh, yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. Okay, we'll move on to the last one. It is uh, APD case number 21 008682 with the force review case number of F2 2021 608. And again, uh, the same materials essentially are reviewed the computer aid dispatch, field reports, criminalistics reports, use of force narratives. I force division reports on body recording uh, videos. There was a misconduct investigation, um, the 2-52 policy, and then attending the briefing. The brief facts are that on October 3rd, officers one of 2021, officers one and three were dispatched to an intersection at Coors Boulevard Bypass and Ellison for an individual huffing computer duster while walking in lanes of traffic. Officer one conducted, contacted Mr. S while Mr. S was walking in traffic and screaming. Mr. S would not comply with orders such as stop or get on the ground and instead ran into traffic on Coors multiple times. The types of force involved in this situation was there was a show of force with an ECW or for those that may not know that's referring to basically a taser. Upon arrival, Officer 2 observed Mr. S running at Officer 1. Officer 2 had his ECW and pointed it at Mr. S. However, he decided not to use the ECW over the concern of a fire hazard due to the canned air. The show of force by Officer 2 was within policy. Um, however, there was potentially an issue of not reporting it, which is what the misconduct and violation was investigating. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, a level 2 takedown leg sweep. Um, officer one grabbed both of Mr. S's shoulders and used his foot to kick his leg out from under him in order to get Mr. S into custody. Officer one and Mr. S fell to the ground and the use of force by officer one was deemed within policy by the FRB and myself. The level one resisted handcuffing. Officers one and two tried to handcuff Mr. S by pulling on his arms. Officer one cautioned Mr. S he would be tased if he did not comply. Mr. S tried to bite Officer 1. Officer 1 told Mr. S to stop biting. Mr. N S then stopped resisting, but officers waited for more backup before trying to handcuff him to avoid further physical fighting. The use of force by the officers 1 and 2 were deemed to be within policy. 
There were low-level control tactics used to get Mr. S into handcuffs and escort him to the police vehicle. At the police vehicle, Mr. S then started to kick. The decision was to place Mr. S in a passive restraint system. In order to do so, he had to be placed on the ground. Orders were given several for several minutes, uh, but he did not comply. So there was a level three takedown on the handcuffed subject. Lieutenant one, officer three, officer two, and officer one all grabbed various positions of Mr. S and lowered him to the ground. The uses by the officers and the lieutenant were deemed to be within policy. There was a second incident of a level one resisted handcuffing. Officers held Mr. S, but Mr. S pulled away from officers one and two while trying to kick and he struggled and those uh, all were deemed to be within policy. The post use of force, the rescue was called to check on Mr. S, but he refused. He started banging his head inside the patrol car and then he was spitting at officers. So officers three and Sergeant one put a protective helmet and a spit sock on him. The specific policies identified were the 2-52-6A6, referring to the leg sweep and the press. The use of leg sweeps, arm bar takedowns, or passive restraint systems shall only be considered and used in the following circumstances to prevent eminent bodily harm or to overcome active resistance. 2-52-4F1, where officers shall only use force to achieve a lawful objective. Officers are used to uh, authorized to use force to effect a lawful arrest or detention of a person and to, or to defend a person or officer from physical harm from another. 2-525C, use of force prohibitions. Officers shall not use force against a restrained or handcuffed individual unless the force is necessary, again, to prevent bodily harm or to overcome active resistance. The 2-524B1, excuse me, ECW use, an officer shall use issue a verbal warning to an individual and allow that person a reasonable time to comply with the warning prior to the deploying of ECW, unless doing so would place the officer or other persons at increased risk. The mis uh, potential misconduct was where the officer did not document that he had the show of force. Um, we don't always know the outcomes of the misconduct investigations at the time of the FRB. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved to accept the findings. Second. Motion and a second to accept the findings. Member Rowe? Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you. That motion passed unanimously. May I ask one other question of Ms. McDermott? please. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, the body camera footage in the presentations, what percentage of the footage do you, do you believe is usually put in there? That really varies per incident. So I, I can't give you an overall percentage. I mean, usually what you are seeing in the force in the in the PowerPoint presentation, which is assuming what you're referring to, um, mm. is is the well, that's the only place that we've seen there, <laughs> unless we ask for it. Correct. Um, it is the the actual incident of so I mean, there's usually a significant amount of video depending again on how extensive the situation is of the various orders or what led up to things. Um, so they, the snippet that you get is the actual usage of the force. So I guess I'd say it's a fairly small percentage of the overall video that exists, but it's, I guess I'd argue the most critical aspects of what you're seeing of what to assess whether or not that force was proper or not. The exceptions being if there is some significant lead up to that perhaps, which again, usually the presenters that create these PowerPoint presentations um, take great pains to make sure they include something that is relevant. So I guess if there was something that would be critical in the understanding of that little snippet of force, they would include that lead up to it. So it really is case by case, but in most cases, what you're seeing are just the small snippets, but the important snippets, they actually show the force.
But if there is something more critical, they would include that because it's for the FRB's understanding as well as you, the board's understanding to try and get a decent picture of what occurred without having to review everything that the investigator reviewed. But my impression from what you just said is that in general, in that presentation, the footage is very representative of, of the incident. Of what you're trying to assess, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, we'll move on to um, E and F. Uh, on these particular ones, I went back, I checked the minutes. Uh, I saw back in, I think it was February or March of last year, there was a motion made that um, member Cass would decide which cases, <coughs> excuse me, that would come forward. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> and, um, but that motion, it was only until the new election this year, it said until a new chair and vice chair were selected. <coughs> Excuse me. So until we um, revamp that, I did go back and look at, <coughs> please excuse me. <coughs> I did look at other agendas prior to that and I didn't see anywhere where a member of the board make that determination. So that is something we'll have to visit again. <coughs> visit again. <coughs> I am so sorry. But that's something we'll have to visit, visit again. <coughs> so with that, there's nothing to report on ERF. And I'm going to ask for a 15 minute break. <coughs> Let's come back at, oh, it's 635, 650. <coughs> Thank you.
Um, <clears throat> we will reconvene our meeting now after our break with item number 10, um, reports from subcommittee. It was a, the case review subcommittee, member Nixon. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Member Nixon, we're on item number 10. Okay. It's the uh, report from the case review subcommittee. So um, we had a meeting, first meeting in a while, actually. I can't tell you the last time we met. I know it was sometime last year. And um, that was April 26th. Our next meeting 
looks like it's May 24th um, at 4.30. And so although we, we discuss some things, it, it, to me, I don't know that I, ha I don't have anything to report because in our last meeting, um, we had gone over some of the activities, uh, not necessarily case review as much as looking at, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Member Crawford, we were talking about some of the policies and uh, uh, looking at those a bit, uh, going over those. And I thought there was something else we were gonna prepare for. Am I wrong in that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty much the case. It's just still kind of in motion. We, you know, we reviewed changes to the policies and procedures that we basically know need to be made because of the ordinance changes. But right. now it becomes a little more open-ended as, as far as where to go from here. So I think there's just more discussion to do. So more to come on that, Patty. Um, I think moreover to Jesse's point is just kind of ironing it out, given the new, it seems like we have a flux, a flexible or a flux, uh, a flux uh, board at any given time. So that's going to have to be discussed as well in ironing out assignments, so on and so forth. So that is my update. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> and like I said, that, that's fine. Um, the subcommittees, um, a lot of times we meet, but we don't come to any conclusions, decisions, we, we're moving forward. So that's fine. And thank you guys, Eric and uh, Member Crawford. So we'll move on to item 11, and that's uh, discussion and possible action item. The first one is the update to the vendor to complete the CPOA staff study. As I said, um, I don't know if there needs to be an action item. Do I need to make a motion again? But I would like those three vendors. It's been since April that I made this request. And I would like to have those three vendors and costs, minimum of three vendors and costs by our next meeting. So I don't believe I need to make a motion. I think I've already requested that. So uh, we'll move on to item B. Uh, consideration of PPRB policies with no recommendations. Uh, Member Crawford? Yeah, sure thing. I'm going to just quickly see if I can share the correct window with you. That should be it. Um, so, you know, Member Cass, who had, had run the policies, had been chair of the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee, had kind of an approach to how he handled policy review. Um, I, you know, for the time being, I'm going to be sticking largely to the same thing he was doing um, so that we're kind of staying the course while we maybe think about changing things. Um, so this is, is pretty similar to what we've done before. I'm just putting together a little bit different info to show the board. Um, the context here, these are policies that the Policy and Procedures Review Board of APD approved. That starts a 30-day period during which um, the board can can comment or request changes to these policies. The 30 day period is a little bit odd because after the 30 day period, we can still comment or request changes to these policies, but it becomes a little different process. You know, we're now kind of starting policy review from the beginning instead of uh, instead of providing our input in our normal step in the process. So that's just context. Uh, these are all policy changes that uh, I do not feel merit any substantial review by the board. Uh, and basically what that means is that I conducted a quick look through of these. I did not find anything that was uh, substantially enough different from what was in these policies previously and what we're used to that I think we need to spend a lot of time looking at them before the end of that 30 day period. By and large, the changes that are included are related to language and the difference between sworn officers and department personnel. That makes up you know, a large percentage of, of all of the changes in these policies. Um, perhaps the only things that are in here that are really substantive policy changes are all sort of technical and are related to APD making some changes to the computer systems basically that it uses for um, for evidence uh, management and for dispatch. And I don't think those are even recent changes. I think it's just taken this long for the policy to kind of catch up with what has already been in use uh, and been the process for some time. Um, so, you know, that, that basically 
fills out what I have to say about these. I don't want to take up a lot of time on them. I don't completely know that the board needs to take an action on these. This is sort of a situation where the board can comment on or request changes to these policies, but it doesn't have to. That said, there is this 30 day deadline and I don't like letting a deadline fly by without, you know, having done anything intentionally with that item. So I think what I would like to do is just move that the board approve sending a brief communication back to the PPRB that the board does not have comments uh, or requests related to these policies. Uh, that way it's just nice and clear that we, you know, that we are completing the, the required review. Um, and yeah, so with that said, that's my motion. I'd like to move that we uh, communicate that the board doesn't have any requests related to these policies. And I'll second that. And we have a motion and a second, member of Barella. Uh, uh, Ms. McDermott has her hand up, which uh, oh, I'm sorry. I want to point out just because I, I wonder if she's about to point out that I'm doing something wrong or forgetting something, so. <laughs> sorry. Hear me. No, I just wanted to um, reaffirm that is my understanding that the uh, policy unit for APD really does appreciate having a statement from the board, you know, either saying we don't have any comment or whatever the comment may be, as opposed to uh, just silence. So I, I was just saying that that's a wise course of action and that's something that they've requested in the past. Excellent. And uh, for clarification, um, Member Crawford, Vice Chair Crawford, sorry. Is this a motion that the agency will uh, have that communication? Uh, usually it's Ali who it's uh, deferred to. Yeah, I think policy. it would probably either be me or Ali. And I think Ali makes a lot of sense because he normally follows up with the mummies anyway. So, okay. so yeah, we'll go with uh, directing Ali to do that. Thank you. So, uh, Barella, I, I do believe we need, there's a motion. The motion was changed, I think, um, but we still have a motion on the floor in a second, as I second it. I'm, I'm confused by what just happened. Are we sending this as a communication from the board or from the agency? I mean, I guess the, the, the trick here, this is a communication from the board. Um, Kind of mechanically, I think it does make sense for Ali to send that over because he is kind of involved on a regular basis with this PPRB process. Um, so he's, you know, I hesitate to say that he's like the board's representative to it, but it, I think it kind of functions that way. So I think it, it just makes sense to send the message via him. So are we formally sending something to him? Let's see what uh, what Council Gooch has to say. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Crawford, Member Wartel. Uh, I think in the past, as uh, Inter Director McDermott had stated, you all would do a letter that said the board has decided, you know, we have no comments. That letter is what I'm hearing is maybe what you are going to ask Ali to pass along. But for clarification and an answer to Member Wartel's question, I think you all need to decide if that's how you want to proceed. Yeah, I do think another option would be, you know, to have Chair French sign it and then and then send it over. And that's, you know, I'm, I, I think those are largely equivalent. Okay, so do we need to restate the motion? Yeah, I mean, I'll go ahead and, and restate the motion, just kind of throwing in my personal opinion that I don't think we need to be super formal about this because of the fact that we aren't really providing input. We're just kind of letting them know that we did look at these. They don't need to like keep waiting to hear from us. Uh, I would move that that the board uh, task Ollie with 
informing the PPRB that the, uh, the board doesn't have comment on these policies. And I'll second that. Member Varela. Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. Thank you, that motion passed unanimously. Thank you, we'll move on to the next one on the uh, item and that is uh, C, response from Deputy Chief Grego concerning the uh, request that we had sent. I asked our interim director to send you uh, the board so you'd have it readily available today. Our original letter that was sent back in August uh, by the chair to the chief concerning this case. It was 19-77270. And we all know that was the one that we had discussed before. It was the officer involved shooting of the gentleman out on Eubank in front of Walmart. And so at our last meeting, we had said that we hadn't received a res written response from the chief. So we did receive a response from Deputy Chief uh, Grego, JJ Grego, and um, I, I hope you all have looked at it. Um, I'd like comments. I certainly have my comments um, that I feel about this response, but I would like to hear from other board members. Uh, uh, do they feel that this response is adequate? And do they believe that our questions were answered? Member Nixon. Being that um, this case is, is so old, um, seems to me like uh, it's, there's some sort of attempt to age it out. Uh, and, and as disturbing as it was and the behavior of the officers in, in the video, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 this is one of those ones that bring me right back to James Boyd and the main reason that the uh, CASA is here and the Department of Justice remains uh, monitoring APD. And um, I, I recall the responses to the findings um, on that side, on, on the chief side. But again, it was even the, with the findings I, I feel, I still feel like it should be uh, re looked at again from a historical standpoint. I don't know that anything could be done at this point um, because again, I think that uh, administratively and bureaucratically the, the, the case has been aged out, but it's still, it's still one that kind of haunts me as a board member because I see, I saw the bias, I saw the despair, uh, just the, the disparity of the behavior of, of the officers in, in treating the man's body when it was still alive. And uh, what, what really rocks me with this and, and just in comparison to APD is that that little lame statement that says, um, we preserve the sanctity of life. And so this, this whole case contradicts that statement. It, it makes me wonder why it's even in any of the policies uh, it, or that policy in, in, in particular at this point. So as disturbing as it was, I'm hoping that there's something else we could do, or at least um, a response can come from management with APD uh, regarding this and, and really do something comprehensive to address the situation because there were so many things done wrong, but this is just my opinion as a citizen uh, in the community. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the, the man had to die like that. I don't think that he had to be shot like that. I think that there were maybe some things to do, but again, I understand I'm armchair quarterbacking that at this point. Um, I'm not in uniform. I don't have a gun and I don't have a badge and I don't have the responsibility. But w one thing, if anybody was to see the video of the way that man was treated and, and what had happened, I, I would find it surprising if they could come up with something a little bit different um, or a lot different in, in that in that situation. So 
I'll just say that because again, this this has been going on for months where we've been trying to get some sort of response, hasn't happened. Um, this is one of the first disturbing um, cases I've seen uh, since I was on the board and uh, definitely one, to, one for the ages. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Member Nixon. Anyone else? Yeah, I will briefly say, you know, I'm kind of of two minds about this case. Um, the first the first thing I want to say is that I was unsatisfied by Deputy Chief Griego's response. I appreciate that this case happened several years ago and that there are not so many people around that were involved in the review of this case directly, which makes it a little difficult but I would have liked to see more effort invested in, you know, substantially addressing the board's concerns um, rather than what we got, which was really kind of just a letter saying that our concerns would not be addressed. Um, so that that is disappointing to me. That said, um, the second thing I want to say is that, you know, I, I, I'm not, certainly not happy with this case. I'm certainly not happy with the situation, but from a purely practical perspective, I do not feel the continuing to keep this case on our agenda is going to produce any better outcome than what we have right now. Uh, I think the way forward to avoid a repetition of this incident is, um, as far as the board's authority is, is probably policy recommendations. I've got a few things written down that are responsive, at least in part to this case that I hope to pursue. But, you know, when it comes to serious use of force review of this case, it's, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about this. And I feel like, unfortunately, we have kind of exhausted the, the options that we have um, to, to kind of get a more satisfactory outcome than, than what we have right now. And I'm, I'm worried that it's just kind of become uh, a waste of time in that way. Are there, Member Wartell, did you have any comment? I, I have no comment. My, my colleagues have, have uh, covered the waterfront as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Well, I am not happy with the response. I don't feel like they really addressed our questions. I think they just kind of uh, said, let's just pat them on the top of the head and move on. And I didn't, I don't, I don't, I really don't like that. But as you said, we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, could one member of staff bring up the executive director's findings and referral letter that he recommended for the board? I know we had it at our last month's meeting, but um, if we're gonna take a vote, I think we should look at also what the director recommended and see if we just wanna move on or if we want to vote on his recommendations. Are those, uh, you able to put those on the screen, Diane? Yeah, just give me a moment. Okay. When were these recommendations made? Uh, it'll say on the letter, I'm not sure. It was, when did we review this? Last year, I think. August 12th of 2021 is the date on the director's letter. This is the one from um, Chair Olivas, I think, to the chief. I wanted the one from um, our, our director on his findings and recommendations on this case. Oh, this is the, uh, Diane, I'm sorry. It's small to me now, I'm trying to read, okay. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute. <laughs> so yes, this is the director's letter um, to the chief originally that was presented to the board. Okay, scroll down to his findings and recommendations, please. Okay, findings, sustained, sustained. So the director found officer one's conduct sustained that the allegation misconduct did occur. Officer two did occur. Officer three did occur. Officer four did occur. The allegation of misconduct did occur. 
officers five exonerated uh, by preponderance of the evidence. The conduct did occur, but did not violate APD policy. A uh, little bit more, Diane, finding the CPA officer six exonerated. Okay, keep going. Or is that the end? Okay. That's the end. Okay. The CPLA finds officer six conduct exonerated regarding the allegations of violation, which means investigation. Okay, so um, Director Harness recommendations, um, findings were officer one, officer two, officer three, and officer fours. Uh, he did sustain um, allegations of misconduct. So we can vote to approve this letter because I don't think we have yet. Is that correct, Interim Director? Or we can... I, I, I honestly don't recall. I think you did um, agree did with the Director's findings. And then because there were so many concerns, that was why the board issued... I, I honestly don't remember i you know maybe you did not actually and i'm sorry to go back and forth I, I should have looked at it but um now that i'm thinking out loud uh i don't think that you actually did make any findings because you had many questions and that's what what prompted the letter that was written previously by chair leva so I, I think you are correct is that you had not as a board actually made a vote on on the particular issue so I guess, what is the pleasure of the board? Do we want to vote that we uh, concur with the um, a director's findings on this letter? Or do you... Uh, Member French. Or Chair French, I mean, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, just, I happen to have uh, this letter right in front of me. Um, the letter that uh, Chair Olivas directed to the Chief of Police, uh, which is also dated August 12, 2021, says that by unanimous vote, the board has raised concerns regarding the findings and actions taken by the Force Review Board. Um, so I I'm, I'm fairly confident that the board voted um, to accept Director Harness's letter, and that's what resulted in the letter from Chair Olivas to the Deputy Chief. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't object to voting on something now, but I'm not 100% sure what it would be other than sending the same letter again. I, I don't think we need to vote if we've already done it. I just don't recall if we had, that was the question. Had we or had we not? If we've already voted on it, then I'm fine with that. Let's move on. Uh, as everyone has said, it's, it's late now. Um, you know, this is, case has been lingering for quite some time. As I said, I'm not happy with the response at all, but what can we do at this time? So um, I do hope in the future, if we send a letter to the chief that he does respond within the 30 days required for a response and that we follow up if he doesn't and that we get a better explanation than just basically quoting SOPs to us. And hopefully the chief responds and not his deputy chief. So with that being said, let's move on to um, item number E, no? Oh, item D. Okay, this will be short and sweet. It's because we, we can um, move on. Um, I know that we had changed in the, in the ordinance, we had changed the letter that is sent to uh, the complainant about his appeal process. Um, I know that you want to tell the complainant that they can appeal. And also there is a criteria if we want to overturn the decision made. But what I don't like about the current appeal letter is it basically has the same tone as the previous one. You can appeal, but you got to meet this, 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 and this. And that was the point of us not uh, of saying you can appeal. You know, you don't have to basically jump through hoops to appeal your case. So I think that we need to review that letter. I think the agency needs to review that letter and I don't mind if you tell them the criteria, it's in the ordinance, but I do think um, tone is everything. And I don't think that the tone of the current one really lends to what, why we did it. 
to make it easier and to let them know that you can appeal. If you don't agree, you can appeal. We may not can overturn it because we can't meet, meet one of these, but there might be some information that you tell us that we didn't hear in the investigation or it wasn't heard. There might be more to the story than what there, we originally heard. So I just think that we should make it so that the citizen is not discouraged from appealing their case. And I see the current letter as basically the same as the old one. And it's 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 basically saying if, if you can't prove that they violated an SOP, if you can't prove this, then don't even waste your time. And that wasn't the, uh, the point of the change. So I would like for the agency to review that letter again and then um, send a copy to the board so we can look at it. And um, member, interim director McDermott, I'll let you speak on that. And I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just saying mm, I read it and basically it's the same to me. It would discourage me. Uh, thank you, Chair French. So just some, some points about it. So I did, you know, after the previous meeting when there was some concern, um, I did go ahead and at least um, clarify a little bit. It's slightly different from before. I did make sure that the uh, information was bolded, that they have the right to appeal, and that upon receipt of the communication, a hearing will be scheduled. So that is clear and, and sort of stands out. Um, when I wrote this draft, I had consulted with uh, the board's independent counsel or our independent counsel to, you know, see if, because I, I talked about whether or not we should have this criteria and both of us agree that it is important that the public know what the criteria is that the board is going to use to make those changes. So we're definitely communicating that this appeal will occur. And we enhanced a little bit in terms of the rules because in looking at the old letter, um, it was a little unclear as to how you go about requesting that. So we made sure we put, you know, here's the address, here's the email so that they can know how to make sure that that information is communicated to us so that we can go ahead and get it scheduled and the timeline for it. So, you know, I, I I'm open to suggestions um, as to what would like to be changed, but ultimately it is important to make sure that the, the true and accurate information is provided in the letter. And then of course, when they do request that appeal, they will receive a letter that states, here's how it works. Here's the frequently asked questions, basically what the procedure is in terms of how many minutes they get to speak and what information and, and all of that. So that would, go to the citizen once they actually request the appeal, but it's important that the citizen knows how to make that request and that it will be set up. Okay, and, and I'm good with that. And Ms. Scooch did tell me she did instruct you to make sure they knew the rules so they didn't come in there with uh, false hopes. And, and I agree, but I just think there's a way to say it and tone it down a little bit. So it's not a major issue. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's work on the letter, Diane. And, and Tina and see if we can't get something that's a little more um, citizen friendly to it, just to the average person reading it, okay? And so that, that's all I had to say on that one. Um, let's move on to uh, E, approval of the CPOA board letterhead. And just let me give a little introduction for this. Um, as the board, we are not city employees. Um, I was asked, I was writing a letter and I asked to use letterhead and I was told because I'm not a city employee, if I want to send information out or communicate with somebody on letterhead, I had to let the agency do it. That's not always my prerogative. I want to send out information. I may want to send out information that doesn't go through the agency. So I ask that um, we get our own letterhead. Um, since then, I have said if we don't have letterhead, if we can just, you know, I don't care if we have stationery that's watermarked with our mission statement on the back. That's fine too, but I do think that we should have the ability to send out communication if we want to without saying, um, asking the agency, will you please put this on this and that? And I will tell you this, I don't care for DocuSign. 
I like to sign my own documents, scan them in and send them out. That's my preference. But with that, um, like I said, I don't wanna belabor this issue, but those are my thoughts about it. So um, I'll let uh, Interim Director McDermott told me she has talked to me about IPA requests and I have a response for that too. So go ahead, Ms. McDermott. <clears throat> Um, yes, I, I just, you know, whether the board sends things through city letterhead or its own letterhead, both are basically subject to IPRA. So since the agency is considered the record holder for those communications, if the letters are basically being sent without the agency having a copy or the knowledge of their existence, that creates problems when it comes to IPRA. Um, so we'll always be available to have whatever approved communications put on letterhead. If you don't want to use DocuSign, whichever chair or doesn't want to use that, as long as you have a printer and a scanner, then we can kind of go back to the old school way of, you know, sending it, you sign it, scan it, send it back. Um, so, you know, ideally we'd want to be on the same page. We want to have a unity. Um, again, so it, it's just that the instruction from the mayor's office is that the respective boards should go through the respective agencies. Uh, we just have to know about the communication because of IPRA. I know there was a sort of a side conversation that Chair French and I had had about CPCs having their own letterhead. They actually don't. And since that had been raised um, by Chair French, that's actually something that I need to address in terms of making sure that there aren't documentations or, or letters going out that, again, the agency has no knowledge of. Because when we receive the IPRA request, if we don't know it exists, then we're telling them there isn't any such thing. And then somebody produces it and it puts everybody into a very big bind when we don't have that. So that's kind of just what I wanted to, to advise the, the board on. And I will say this, Diane, I went back and I thought about other boards that I sat on and I'm surprised that these IPA requests haven't come to the board prior because I know they will send the entire board um, emails saying we have this IPA request if you've had any telephone conversations, if you've had any emails, if there's been any communication, we have this IPRA, please submit your information, submit that information to our records uh, person, because I think everybody has a, a records, a custodian of records, and that's what we do. And so that's how we handle that. And I'm surprised that we as a board um, have not received that type of communication uh, on these IPRA requests because you don't know if there's been an email, you don't know if there's been a phone conversation and most, most IPRAs uh, ask for all communication. So with that being said, that's how it's addressed. And I'm, I'm not saying that we need it often, but there are there's few and far in between times when I wanna send, I would wanna send something out and maybe another chair. And I'm gonna say, hey, I wanna send this myself. It doesn't have to go through the agency, I wanna send it myself. So we can talk about that more later but I will say we don't have to have letterhead, but um, we could use something just like on our agenda. Our agenda is not on city letterhead and it was told to me that city, the mayor's office said, you're not city employees, so you cannot use city letterhead. And that's always been the rule since I worked there too. So I'm not sure why they've been even started putting our information on letterhead because we're not city employees. So, um, we can move on with that, but that was the whole issue with that. Well, Are there, were there I'm, any comments? I'm confused. We're not yes. city employees, well, but we are a city board. We're officially a, an instrument of the city, of the city council in this case. Um, if, if the issue is IPRA and being a record keeper, then simply sending communications that, that we uh, create, sending copies of those communications to the agency as record keeper should satisfy that requirement. And I would like to see it in writing from the mayor's office that we are not allowed to use city letterhead, that we are not allowed to use letterhead. If I may, Member Wartell, it's not that you're not allowed to use city letterhead, it's that you are not able to be provided blank letterhead, which was the request that a blank letterhead was provided so that information could be done. You absolutely can use city letterhead 
by providing the information and then we place it on the letterhead for you. So it's just that the board wouldn't have the ability to have a stack or an electronic blank letterhead version is the only issue. Well, that gives you the right then to refuse to put something that we want on letterhead on letterhead. And I don't think that's appropriate. Well, that's true, but there wouldn't be an occasion in which the agency would refuse the board in terms of putting communication on. There wouldn't be? No. Well, that's like our discussion of what's something rare or not. <laughs> well, if you, have, if you as a board have voted to create a letter and are as a board sending it out, then that's the board's right and that's what the agency would do. Well, if I send something out that I want to send out from my email, I will send the agency a copy um, saying that I sent this email out. But I absolutely, I, I can't think of a time, but there might be a time. Um, I'll tell you of a time when we were getting ready to send out the request to the chief's office to readdress the uh, letter dated August the 12th. I wanted to go into my computer, change the date, do all that, submit it, and I ask, that's all I was gonna do. I said, can I have letterhead so I can just scan this in and email it to the chief, but I was told no. So there are times when I, as I told you, Diane, I sent the email, I just attached the old letter and I'll send you a copy of my email, even if it's after the fact, but uh, there's, there is no way that I'm gonna say that everything I do and everything I say and all my communication, every time it's gonna go through the agency, but I will notify the agency if I do. And that's probably few and far between and probably uh, not uh, an issue that we need to even bring up until it happens. I think member Crawford had a- Yeah, uh, member question. Crawford, I couldn't see, I'm sorry. Given that communications that go on agency letterhead are typically communications which are authorized by the board and that restrictions, for example, on ex parte communication kind of create that as, as sort of a, a restriction in a lot of cases, I am a little concerned about the scenarios in which a member of the board would produce something on letterhead that did not go, for example, via Ms. Barela, since, you know, it would need to be recorded in the minutes of a board meeting. I, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm, I would almost certainly be opposed because I'm very nervous about creating a different path by which official appearing communications originate that, you know, have not necessarily gone through the board. Um, it, it, that just creates a very kind of confusing potential scenario. Let me, let me make my position clear on this. I don't think anything should go out from the board that's signed by an individual member. That should be, everything should go from the chair. The chair is the touchstone for the, for the public. And, and just, just, just to be clear, just that was the board had decided that we send the letter to the chief. That was the board's decision to send the letter to the chief concerning this case that we just reviewed. That, that was the, the issue. It wasn't that I was acting without board or discussing it or whatever. So on that right. particular the, example. The, the argument I'm making is just that producing letters uh, on, on agency letterhead sort of necessarily already requires the involvement of agency staff um, since those originate in a board meeting. So I'm just not sure that there is much to be gained by removing one of the several points that agency staff would be involved. And I think that there is a lot of potential confusion and pitfalls to be created by having some second type of, of letterhead. And that's just to our point, Member Crawford, as well, is that it's just, we're not looking to control the business of the board or, but we are the necessity of being informed in what's going on. And so again, anything that the board has voted upon and needs on letterhead, that would be done by the agency so, or for the board by the agency. Any more comments? Okay, let's move on. 
I think uh, Ms. Gooch. Yes. Or was it was it Carlos that said he had something to say on this? I think it was. Mr. Pacheco? Pacheco? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so um, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. I think uh, uh, talks about the, the MOU were still in progress. Um, unfortunately, I had been out of, because of some health concerns, some health issues, but uh, hopefully we'll get back on track with that. I think it's Mostly, uh, we need to reach out to uh, APOA on, on it and check their position on some things. I think I responded to the comments, if I'm not mistaken. Were there any updates to that, Ms. Gooch, or that's where you are too? Um, Chair French, no, that's correct. Uh, the board voted on the most recent version of the meeting or so ago. The ball is now in the APOA and city's court, so we are waiting on steps from both of those parties. There's nothing that's um, being held up by the board, and there's no further action at this time the board needs to do. So, um, and I'll, uh, I'll follow up with, uh, with APOA, and hopefully we'll have some more answers uh, for the board uh, before the next meeting. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to the next one. Um, the Citizen Police Academy training, that's a requirement of the board. Um, after rethinking that, I know the board all agreed that was good training, but it, it's a serious time constraint on our new members. Uh, 12 weeks, two times a week, six to nine, there are some classes you don't have to take. I think is, um, and, and I will refer to those that have gone through it, uh, some members were allowed to take it in two days or two weekends or whatever. The other of us are required to take a 12 week class. Um, I don't know. I think it's, um, it was a good training. I enjoyed it, but looking back, I don't know if it makes me a better board member. So I don't know if, uh, I don't know how your feelings are, Jesse, cause you're right in the middle of it. But I just think that it's, it's, it's a serious, requirement to put on a new board member to devote 12 weeks. And if you miss a class, you have to miss, catch it up. I mean, doctor's appointments or whatever. I just, I, I, I think that um, we should reconsider the requirement. I think it can be recommended, but I, I think we need to reconsider the requirement and I'll um, refer to our newest board members for that, uh, member Wartell and member Crawford. Member Crawford, you're taking it right now, right? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm currently enrolled in in CPA, and uh, you know, I have sort of mixed feelings on this one as well because I think that the material that is covered in the CPA, some of it is very important to the work of the board, and it would be, I think, a great loss in our our credibility as an oversight agency for the board to not have that information, which seems difficult to obtain by means other than the CPA. That said, the CPA as it exists now is six hours a week for, for 12 weeks. Um, I haven't done the arithmetic on how many hours that is total, but it's, it's quite a few. Uh, I think on the balance, uh, roughly half of it is considered required for board members. I believe that determination was made within APD perhaps by uh, Commander Tapia, but I, I'm not, not completely sure where that list originates, but I, I think it, it adds up to roughly half the courses. Um, that mitigates the time commitment somewhat, but not very well because the CPA as it is offered is not at all set up to have people attending who are only required to go to certain courses. Uh, and I, I really appreciate, um, I hope I can remember his name, Detective Ramos's, uh, you know, efforts on this because he's been been calling me, you know, to, to try to keep me up to date on, on when different things will actually be offered, but they do reschedule things. It's just, it's a big frustration. And so the, you only really have to attend half of it is not as much of a of a reduction in the obligation as it might sound like. You kind of have to go every evening to really stay up to date on everything. I, I've had to miss quite a few and it's been, uh, it's been a pain. 
So, you know, I'm not sure where that where that leaves me, right? I, I'm a little hesitant to get rid of the, the requirement, but I do think it is an issue the way it's set up right now. It's going to be a big issue with obtaining and retaining uh, board members. And I wonder if it would be possible to make arrangements to have, you know, the same info presented in a in a different, more compact way. Um, and, and kind of before I, you know, see the, the pulpit, I'll just give the, the brief complaint to that. Um, and this is a whole maybe Pandora's box to open, but I, I have been concerned at times that the content of the CPA uh, from certain presenters can become very much a matter of advocating for specific policy positions which is a little awkward uh, when it's viewed as a, a mandatory training exercise for the board as well. I think there is in practice definitely an element of indoctrination involved, which is not you know, necessarily desirable for new members of an ostensibly uh, independent board. Thank you for that. And I'll look forward to see if you volunteer to get tased, okay? <clears throat> Member Wartell. Well, I don't, I, I don't have a lot to say about this because Member Crawford just made my arguments. The, the advocacy issue, the feeling that to a certain extent it's um, uh, biased information toward the police department, and we're being trained by them. Uh, the fact that people have satisfied, our members have satisfied the, uh, the requirement in different ways. All of those things, I, and then the time commitment, all of those things I, I think are important considerations. And uh, if, if the information that's being given is so important, then I shouldn't be voting on anything that we're doing right now until all of that training is finished. And I don't agree with that. I, I agree with you. I don't think that that training makes us a better board member. And as I pointed out to someone in the past, but I may have done it actually at a board meeting, there is this, uh, with the earlier support of making it a requirement, there is the feeling, the boot camp feeling of, well, I went through it, so everybody else ought to go through it. And I really disagree with that attitude. So I, I am strongly in favor of making that a recommendation, not a requirement. I agree with that. And uh, like I said, and, and the other reason that I brought it up is, um, remember Nixon, did you take it in two weekends? I can't remember what you had said when you when you took it. Um, was it two weekends, or did, did they make you take the twelve week class? <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that I could take it in two weekends, I wouldn't even be here. I thought it was overkill um, indoctrination, and some of it was just downright ridiculous because basically you had the police department telling on themselves, and some of the some of the behaviors and some of the activities that we had. It, to me, and as biased as it was, the survival training, um, the ideas and the ideology was, in my opinion, a legalized militia. It wasn't, there were pieces of it that I understand a police officer would need as far as survival uh, in that position. But to me, to go 12 weeks, um, first of all, that's, a, that, that's filtering out people. If you're not retired or you don't have control over your own, uh, you know, schedule, don't have to work to put food on the table or anything like that, you'd be a great candidate. Most folks like that are usually retired. Um, and I, I, I kind of felt like going through it in the condensed version was even much because I thought that a lot of the stuff that they, we went through was, was really unnecessary. And to Jesse's point, I thought it was indoctrination as opposed to information. Um, so yeah, I took it in two, two uh, weekends. Like I said, I think that's a little bit lengthy. Um, 
I, I, I have no desire to know every single thing that a police officer has to go through. Um, I, I, and, and even as a board member and being a citizen, this position asks for a hell of a lot of your time. And I don't see the appreciation of the time that we spend in a lot of ways. Um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's almost like we're checking a box. And so to have somebody go through 12 weeks of that training, that kind of training, that kind of indoctrination and still do participate and be part of the board is really pushing it. And, and you can just tell by the past year, you know, the turnover that we've had on the board, the attrition rate. Um, there are so many things that be, could be done better on that end, but but that that I don't know who came up with that. Maybe it was between the union and the APD that came up with the training. But I don't I don't think it's necessary. I think it's overkill times times ten. And so I'm hoping something will change because it's very hard to get. I'm beginning to realize it's very hard to get uh, good people on the board um, because good people end up leaving for very good reasons. And I'm just kind of crossing my fingers and hoping we can keep the good people we have on it now. Um, but I, I'm with my, uh, Mike as well. I don't think it's necessary. If I thought that you, Mike had to go through this training in order to be a board member, then, then that, that doesn't even make sense because if I'm looking at Mike, his experiences and his life experiences and the things that he'd gone through before even going to the board or going to CPA are what make him, what would make him a very good board member. It's not so much, oh, you've gone through the training, the CPA training. So, you know, that's just my two cents on it. I, I think this is, I think it's just, it's been one of the biggest damaging uh, parts of, of, of serving. Uh, on this. And I was on CPC, by the way, before this. So I went from CPC here. And, um, you know, the, it's an indoctrination. Um, I could have easily done without it. I have a healthy respect for balance. I have a healthy respect for non-bias um, uh, looking, at, looking at things. And I don't think that it added any, uh, it didn't add any value to me serving on the board. Thank you. And, and you know, I, if, you, if my memory serves me right, uh, city council had removed it and the board requested to put it, to retain it. City council had said, you don't have to go through that. But we as a board said, oh yeah, <laughs> we want it. And so I think we need to reconsider that. And um, maybe city council knew best because we do have uh, new board members too, maybe three coming on very within the next month or two. And I think that's a lot to ask uh, that they devote that much time. And, you know, people have not only jobs, people have families. Yeah. Uh, Member Crawford um, had a, his husband was sick. He had an anniversary. They, you know, these things come up in 12 weeks. You know, I had a doctor's appointment in Denver. And so I had to make up that class. I just think it, like you said, it's overkill. And if they can't offer it to us the same way as they did other individuals, I think that we need to reconsider saying, we believe as a board, we need to uh, have that training and just say recommended and not required. So I will put that on the next month's agenda. Um, I don't know, it's as an action item now. I, I don't know. Um, why can't it be? Yeah, why can't it be? Okay. And okay. by the way, for the record, I didn't vote for that. So okay. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> okay, maybe I was of the mind that Mike's talking about. I had to do it, so all y'all have to do it. But anyway, so, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, but I because it is an action item, I'm going to make a motion that the board ask city council to remove it from the new ordinance and say it's recommended, not required. And that's second. my. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I think member Crawford had something and then I wanted to just give you a little bit of information about the abbreviated if you'd like. Sure, member Crawford. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, I, I feel a little a little bad because I think, at least my recollection is I think I was maybe the most vocal member of the board and in, in wanting to not remove the requirement and this is the, this is the danger of, of getting what you asked for right. Um, 
You know, I think my concern is I do think there are components of the CPA that are very valuable to the board's work. Now, I was just kind of doing a little exercise of looking at the CPA schedule that I happen to have on my desk and and thinking about which courses I thought those were. It, it's not a whole lot. Um, and I think, you know, maybe the the only you know, you made a motion and I think I, I, I support it. My only caveat is that I would like to make the request that that we make a genuine effort to try to get some of that material presented to the board by alternate means. Um, I'm not totally sure what those means are, um, but I, I want us to try. My big objection to removing required training from the board was and still is not even so much about the training itself, but about the bigger like philosophical problem that it felt like the the city or I, I don't know that I should place blame because it, it depends on the item, but someone was failing to make a number of trainings available to the board. And I did not like the city council's solution was to take them off the training requirements rather than to address, you know, why is it that there are things like this simulation exercise that used to be a requirement that like years had gone by with it being fuzzy how someone even did that. Uh, I just really don't want to perpetuate that situation. So I would support eliminating the CPA requirement, but I would like to in the same step push for figuring out some way to get, I think ideally someone from APD to present some of that information, you know, to board members. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I'll add that to my motion, but we still, we certainly can look into that. Okay. Uh, Ms. McDermott. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, to let the board know I had had some conversations with Lieutenant Tapia regarding some of these concerns. And in terms of the abbreviated, the reason why they don't offer the abbreviated anymore is apparently it was at least based on what I was told, the feedback from both the attendees of that, as well as the presenters, that it just did not provide very good information to either side, good feedback, good, good education to the, to the attendees. So the, they deemed it to be at least a, a non, not an effective way to do it. And therefore we're not contemplating on doing the abbreviated again, which is why they're doing it back to the, to the full. Now, uh, I did, again, have some conversations with her, and it does sound like APD and the Academy is open to some sort of a discussion, uh, whether you leave it required or not, you know, I mean, yes, the council had it as a recommendation, the board fought to have it put as a, rec as a requirement now. Um, if you choose to try and appeal to the, to the council to have it removed again, you know, that's up to you, but if, uh, if there is a tweak that I guess would like to be happening with it, then perhaps that's a conversation that we can have with the academy so that if it still stays a requirement, maybe different classes, maybe different scheduling, things like that. So that just they were open to that is all I'm trying to say. So I think that's a good idea if there's some particular um, courses. As Jesse said, I think there were some that they could enlighten us some on that they should give classes, but um, they don't give the ones that they're currently supposed to give us. Um, so that's yeah something we, we can certainly look into. But like I said, um, I appreciate that. But at this time, um, were there, was there any more conversation on that? Discussion on that? Uh, yeah, Member Nixon. Um, so, it, you know, I think that it should be taken off for now. And I think that having that discussion to bring it back would be a good idea, but for right now, I, I don't think we should. It should be mandated, mandated um, at that at this point. I, I think it needs to be revamped. And and the other thing I'm concerned with is like with this whole casa, who's telling us that we have to take this training? If the academy's mandating it, uh, you know, I don't I don't know if the monitor's mandating it, whatever it is. I don't think that anybody's really actually looked at it and said, okay, let's let's look at this practically and see if we can come up with a training schedule or, or a training curriculum that makes sense as opposed to just the overkill. So I'm, I'm totally open to having a discussion later and I, I wouldn't mind being part of those discussions. But uh, for right now, I, I'm definitely 
I think we should kill it. Remember Gooch? Oh, excuse me, Miss Gooch, no, sorry. Gooch. Um, and uh, thank you, Chair French and Member Nixon. Uh, just to answer a couple of your questions that were going to dovetail into what I wanted to mention, the amended ordinance um, that includes the requirement says APD is to determine which portions of the Civilian Police Academy are necessary for the board. So while the board is free to advocate and ask City Council to do um, what is at issue on the pending motion, it may be that um, the board wants to talk with APD, as Director McDermott had mentioned, about maybe pairing back or focusing what classes really are most useful to the board in the interim. That's fine, because I, I, I know it's not the CASA. I know it, like you said, it's, it's city, city Council will take it, going to take it off, so it's not part of that. So I'm going to leave my motion as it was, that this requirement be removed. Um, I'd, I'd like to make one more comment. Sure. Change. And that is that it's my belief that we have been appointed to this board because we have a certain moral compass that we think about issues logically, that we can bring an unbiased critical eye to certain issues. We are not appointed to this board because we have a deep understanding of police procedure, the Albuquerque Police Department, or any number of other details, uh, we're able to make judgments. And I don't think that that training particularly helps us. And I think that our other members have stated that even more coherently than I. All right, any more discussion? Uh, Member Barilla, would you read that motion back to me, please? Um, sure, motion by Chair French to ask City Council to remove and or eliminate the CPA requirement. Thank you. Did I get a second on that? I think Member Nixon second. That is correct. Okay, all right, would you take the roll? Uh, Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartell? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank and, you. Uh, chair French, for clarification, what is the means of communication? Is that through the chair? Uh, that's fine. Yes. I will say that Councillor Bassan had said that once the ordinance was passed, if we, uh, the one time I did speak to her that if we uh, thought of anything else or we wanted any more changes that they would certainly be open to a uh, communication about that. So um, we will I will move forward with that because we do have potentially three members coming soon within the next month or two. So I will move on to the next item. And that is the ride along scheduling. Um, I think it was said by Interim Director McDermott, and I believe it's in the IMR, that uh, ride-alongs are to be reinstated and we're to start back. Uh, so the reason that I put this on there is because um, as members, as the board, we're not, we don't know officers. I mean, the majority of the board don't know officers, don't know where they could go, what time, any of that. So <laughs> with that being said, I would like for um, the agency to reach out to the substations, see which ones are offering ride-alongs for us and uh, which shift. The IMR did say that we had to do two four-hour ride-alongs, and I believe it's every six months. Um, but as board members, we don't have um, the knowledge or we don't know who to communicate with. We don't know any of that. So uh, please get us, um, a list of the area commands and which ones will be offering ride-alongs and what shifts. And so the board can get back with you and, and the board members, because I know the ones that have jobs will have to schedule this, could be on the weekends, it could be you know, after swing shift, 
It only has to be four hours. It can be close to your house. You can go southeast if you want a real busy ride along. You can always say, I want to go on a ride along out of the southeast sub. Careful, uh, share French. I live southeast. So. <laughs> That's okay. I, I understand. We, I'm just talking strictly from the st statistics they give us. Nothing <laughs> personal. No, that's fine. So, uh, so Chair French, if I could just put a little bit of information on that. So there's a central process in which that happens. And I will have to double check who the contact is. I think he had been at a board meeting at one point, but I'll, I'll verify who that is. But anyway, it's a central process that you do have to fill out the background. I believe all of you probably have satisfied that, but I will double check that. And then it's a scheduling through that central office. So it won't be like a list of substations or anything. It'll be, here's where you go, here's how you let them know, and then they will arrange that. So I'll get them details for you, but, um, and coordinate to help you with that, but it's just not gonna be like a list of substations and this or that, it's gonna be like the central process. Well, would you ask the central process which substations are offering it? Because I live close to Foothills and I'm not going to go to Northwest Command that is by Rio Rancho. I think all of them, you know, have the capacity um, to do it. So if you just express that you would like to go to this substation on this shift, um, they usually are able to accommodate that because, of course, the officers are working 24-7. So if you wanted to work a, a 2 a.m. shift because that worked better for your schedule, you certainly could. Um, and I think it, it works for whatever area command you wish to, to do. So, Member Wartell? Nothing. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I know that you've had to fill out the documentation on a ride-along. You have to fill that documentation out. I'm not uh, a familiar, you'll send us the information for the central, whatever it is, Diane, because I, I, I was always pointed to a certain substation. Yeah, they've updated the process. That's why I mentioned it and it's relatively new. So that's why I say I'll, I'll get the details. I'm a little fuzzy on them. I just recall having the conversation with the, the person in charge of that and saying that they've updated it. They're trying to make it easier, more streamlined. Um, so that it isn't this sort of happenstance, you know, a paper form and, you know, you go here and you go there. And so they're just trying to make it more easy. Um, so, but I don't have all the details in my head right now. So I'll get them. Member Crawford. Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, which I think, you know, uh, Director McDermott kind of covered this, but I, my suspicion is that the process that I've been trying to use is the old process, because I've been, for the last several months, uh, regularly calling the, the woman at the front desk at Valley Command and getting her to nag all the ship supervisors for me. Um, and I, I think she's a little tired of uh, talking to me on the phone at this point. So yeah, I'd, I'd really love to find out um, what the process is now and see if, see if that works better. And that's fine. And, and again, any member that is having any difficulty like that, please reach out to the agency. And you know we don't want this to be a frustration. So if you're having some resistance or if you're having some difficulty, then you just need to let us know so that we can get it figured out or fixed. Well, it's, it strikes me that since this is a requirement and, and I don't know who can ask to do a ride along from the general public, but shouldn't we have some sort of a priority with these folks? Uh, yes, I mean, if you need a ride along, I, I, you know, usually in the past, and again, this has been a long time in my history, but when I've wanted a ride along, I get a ride along. And so, you know, any of the board members, because it is a requirement, you, you, you're not going to be denied that opportunity. So we just have to figure out the proper process. And like I said, I've been informed, but I'm, I just am not drawing the details in my mind right at the second as to what exactly that process is. But um, I, I do understand that they've updated that process. And, you know, again, we as the agency uh, can facilitate any stumbling blocks so that you make sure that you're in compliance with your training on that, re on that regard. Yeah, any information that you could help us with would be greatly appreciative. I appreciate it. Yeah, just for, for member Wartel's information, I, I don't think the problem is one of prioritization or even of availability. 
I think it, it, it really is just like a bureaucratic issue that the process right now is very informal. Um, so I think it's just, it's extremely easy for your request to fall through the cracks. So it usually does. So I, I'm optimistic that a more centralized method will, will kind of address that problem. And, and the agency ought to be able to help us, right? Yep, like I just said, we're here to help you on that. <laughs> Thank you, let's move on to our next one. Um, response concerning the IMR 15. Um, I'll leave that up to member Crawford, our vice chair, but uh, the reason I put this on here is because I don't know if, if all of you have read it. Uh, I know you don't wanna read the 300 and some pages, so start with approximately 304, and it addresses uh, the CPOA and the CPOA board. And any concerns any responses um, that you want to address? I think we need to get them to member Crawford. Um, um, Councillor Gooch, is, do we have a deadline on this? Um, Chair French, yes. So my understanding is the Department of Justice has put a deadline of June 15th for submission of notice letters to the court. Um, and also that the order in which the letters are provided to the Department of Justice dictates the order in which people get to address the court. So there's an interest in being sooner in line than later because we tend to run out of time at those hearings. Um, my intent and hope is that the board would give some direction to your IMR liaison member Crawford this evening with ideas of what your main points could be or to say, liaison, please tell us which we would like the points to be so that at your uh, next meeting, you have a letter to vote on and approve so that we can meet the June 15th deadline. So member Crawford, when would you like us to get it to you? Because I know you're busy also. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as soon as possible, but if, if there is any feedback, um, you know, we would need to vote on it at the next meeting. Uh, I would say, I, I really don't want to put this off too far. So even though that meeting is going to be a month out, at least as far as I know at the moment, uh, I would definitely like to be able to get that together by like two weeks from now. So that there's plenty of time to uh, make sure it's with the agenda and everything. Um, I can, uh, I, I can, and I'm sorry, Member Ortel, I was just going to say, I can present a little bit to you. I don't know if everyone totally knows the context here. Um, I can kind of fill in what I know and a few things that I think are, are relevant uh, to the board. Yeah, I, I was only going to ask what you wanted exactly from us. Yeah, so this is a little interesting because as the they keep this very close to the chest, but as the, uh, the IMR liaison, uh, I was given an opportunity to review a draft version of the IMR before it was released. Um, and at that point in time, I did not find anything in the IMR that I thought was incorrect. Um, there are definitely things in the IMR that are relevant to the board. Um, but there wasn't anything that struck me as, as, you know, something that we needed to try to get corrected because it was inaccurate or, or misrepresented the situation. Now, that was my feeling when I read the, the I am more. Yeah, it, certainly if there's anything I missed, I would definitely like to know about that. You know, if there's anything in there that, that a member feels is, is incorrect or, or needs to be addressed. Um, the other, you know, big item that I pulled out of the IMR was, was just things contained in the IMR that are, are either findings that the board has, has failed in some way or recommendations that the board take an action. I will just quickly share uh, a document I threw together really quickly that is just some quotes um, that I pulled out of the IMR. And there are kind of two categories of things in the IMR that relate to the agency and the board. This is my own taxonomy that I'm making up. Um, but the things that I pulled into this document are items that are really about the board and the board's function. 
the IMR spends a lot more time because they audit the agency's cases um, going into kind of detail on specific issues with specific cases. Um, that is certainly of interest to the board since we sort of supervise the agency, but I didn't didn't pull that out since that's mostly, you know, for, for Director McDermott um, to, to kind of deal with on those issues. Um, a lot of what was in there related directly to the board was uh, somewhat general. Um, you know, you can see here, continue to build on, on what we've been able to do so far as far as getting to full staffing. There was a note on on page 46 about the agency that I thought stood out considering the process that we have currently started, um, where the independent monitor both said that it, it may be the executive director needs additional administrative support and a recommendation um, for a, a staffing study that was kind of contingent on the agency getting to full staffing and, and still having issues. But I think, you know, we've kind of already decided to, uh, to go down that path. And it seems like the IMT sort of agrees with us there. Um, training continues to be a big issue. The two big takeaways there are that the IMT continues to want to see better accounting of the training status of board members. So that's something to continue to keep in mind and, and look for opportunities to improve. There is also a desire for a more standardized approach to reporting on ongoing training for board members. Uh, you know, I haven't done that yet since I'm a new board member, but I understand the practice had been these sort of like essay report outs. Um, the IMT didn't dislike that, but uh, I don't think the IMT liked that they were kind of getting different things from different board members. And, you know, there's an understandable desire to have like a, a standard uniform expectation. So that might be a takeaway from us. I think we might want to look at developing a form or something so that we kind of have the same thing from, from every person on the ongoing training. Um, page 54 is really about investigations. Uh, I just, I pulled this out because I thought this was kind of a big high level thing that was worth bringing to the board's attention. The IMT expressed a concern on a few cases that the agency was not doing enough to investigate the complaint. That was usually coming in a context where there was info available, especially the OBRD recordings. Um, but the investigator kind of relied on that info and didn't, you know, look into other possible angles. Um, the IMT took exception about that, and it's, you know, says right there we're on notice. So that's just something to keep in mind as we continue to look at at investigations. Is the IMT's concern that those investigations need to be thorough, even if, you know, it, it kind of feels like something like the OBRD provides uh, enough information already. And, and the, the IMT raised kind of a couple of specific examples where there might have been issues that, that originated from that happening. Uh, the IMT brought up the issue of mediation. This is like a super high level thing that probably needs a lot of discussion. Um, the mediation efforts have not really been successful. Part of that is because I think everyone's a little fuzzy on how that should work exactly. So there's clearly, clearly some work to be done there. Um, and then finally, just on page 67, I, I don't know, I may have kind of lost some of the meaning of this sentence because of the way I ex exerted it, but the IMT was discussing uh, the way that the board um, exercises its oversight of the investigations and kind of repeated a concern that's appeared across multiple IMRs that the IMT feels like the board was spending too much time reviewing cases in sort of a non-substantive way uh, and that the board's efforts would be better spent uh, on appeals and requests for reconsideration. That you know, maybe cross our fingers, this might already be obsolete because we've made substantial changes in response to the ordinance change uh, in how we do things, but uh, just a, another item to keep in mind. So none of those things are really issues where it's a response exactly. I was really just trying to pull out the things that I thought were most important to the board. And, and that's, yeah, that's honestly because I did not feel like I found anything that merited uh, you know, argument 
Exactly. Uh, I think we do have an opportunity that we should take advantage of to explain ourselves a bit as far as some things that have gone wrong. But I don't think there's anything that I saw in the report that we need to, uh, you know, uh, get ready to defend ourselves on. Thank you, Member Crawford. I, I really appreciate that. I had read it too. I think one thing that we do need to say is that the, uh, uh, the IMR recognized that our agenda and our, our minutes are um, non-biased, fair, and they really appreciated that. They, they, they made a comment, complimented us on that. So, um, Councillor Gooch. Um, Chair French and board members, I think that if, if, if the historic historical process rings true and anyone has an interest, the board tended to pick one, two, three top hot topics to raise for the court. And I would really advocate the board consider keeping its number one most important topic, the need to have a full complement. That has not um, been done. It's not currently done. And I know city council is trying, but I think it's something that the board needs to raise for the court, the public, and keep front and center so that the parties help you because there's a reason there's nine openings and it's because the job you are doing is hard and it's important. So I would advocate to you all as um, clients for this letter that you really consider seriously putting that front and center as an issue or item to raise to the court and the public as part of the letter. Okay, thank and you. I, I think that gets, that does kind of a good job of, I guess, getting at the gist of maybe what I'm looking for from board members too is, you know, I, I guess to all board members, if there's anything in this IMR that you think is something that merits being, you know, discussed with the court and with all the stakeholders present, this is, this is our opportunity. So please uh, try to think of those things. And we will. I will review those again. And, and thank you, um, Councillor Gooch, because we will try to keep it to three if possible. Okay, good idea, prioritize. So let's move on with uh, Jay. Sure. I'm sorry, may I interject one moment? Sure. Uh, I was just gonna say, you know, another big question that is something that uh, your independent counsel and myself are trying to get answers from APD, but another big topic, if you will, just for your uh, benefit member Crawford as you're composing this is, is the training, having clear understanding of what some of these training components are, how useful they are, what, who's providing them, what should they be telling you or covering? So a lot of ambiguity over some of the training pieces is um, something that I think that the board should expect both clarity from the monitoring team, the DOJ and APD as to what all these pieces are and who is gonna give them to you and, and how it all works. So that, cause that's a, a murky subject, I believe in this whole situation. And uh, real quick before we move on, uh, Chair French, uh, I just wanted to put a put a, a hard a hard line on what I'm asking for. Um, I would ask the board to please get your thoughts uh, to me um, by the second uh, of June, so that's two weeks from today. Uh, and I'll I'll probably try to remember to send out an email nag uh, in a week or so about that as well. I started to say, Member Crawford, please send me a reminder. <laughs> Give me a few days, okay? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, we'll move on to, um, let's see, where are we? Um, item J, social media policy, Interim Director McDermott. Uh, yes, Sherry French, I wasn't quite sure how you wanted this presented. Um, the information was provided to the board as to what the uh, chief's response was regarding the policy. And I'm looking for it here. Uh, I don't know if you'd like me to read it for the benefit of the public or show it or, or how your preference is. I guess I'll leave that up to the board. Did everybody have an opportunity to read the chief's response to the social media? 
I know member Crawford, that was one of your, you had brought that up. Uh, did you get an opportunity to read that? Yes, and I, I must admit that despite this being my baby, I actually have not read it. Um, I don't know that I want to uh, subject the board to, to Miss McDermott reading the whole thing. And I'm just pulling it up myself now, but I, I would be curious if Ms. McDermott could try to just kind of summarize it to us. So essentially the summary being is that the chief feels that a modification of policy is not necessary at this time. Um, he did inform the board that the city is currently revising its administrative instruction dealing with social media. And therefore the revision would likely change the APD social media. Um, I'm not sure I, I really, I guess you'd say agree with the, the, the sort of middle content. And basically the, the chief statement was the current policy is clear between APD's official social media accounts and personal accounts maintained by the employees, of the department uh, and communication staff that they're clearly identified as such. So yes, the APD pages are clearly identified and they're the ones where the public should be going and following and getting its appropriate information where at least from our investigative experience and seeing is when we have this sort of as as we use the term blurring of the lines where private accounts are used and absolutely um, APD personnel are entitled to have private accounts just like any other um, you know citizen but when you start engaging in the public on information that is on APD, it's it's fine to share APD content, you know, but it's when you start engaging in new content, if you will, that's sort of based on and saying things like uh, I uh, as a representative or you know we those types of things. So I I still feel it's a, it's a bit murky, but uh, the chief is is bringing up the point that this will be modified down the road. Um, granted these complaints, I guess you'd say don't come too often, but they do come. And hmm. I, there you go. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, if I might, your French. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, this is interesting. I think I agree with Director McDermott, I don't, I don't feel that the, the current policy is clear enough, but I am sympathetic to the fact that the city is taking this issue up. I don't know if anyone has any idea what the timeline on that might be, but my gut feeling is that we might want to issue another policy recommendation on this topic, maybe where we kind of shore it up and clarify it to directly address the chief's response but I tend to think we should probably wait until after the city finishes their policy process because, you know, I wonder if the city is going to try to address some of these same points uh, and I'd hate to, I don't know, kind of duplicate effort or make it confusing when APD is being told to revise their policy by two different people. Okay. <clears throat> APD has always seemed to be a little more strict than just a city overall policy that tends to um, be for the all employees throughout the city, no matter blue collar, white collar, whatever. Uh, but um, I agree. If, if, if you want to wait and let's see what that is, Member Crawford, I'm certainly agreeable to that. So thank you. We'll move on to our next item. It is getting late. Um, so <clears throat> We have a lot of serious use of force cases, the cases that we need to review. And I remember on one of our, uh, we had discussed this in the past about setting up a special meeting to catch up, for lack of a better word, to review and move forward and get these cases done. Um, I don't like to be behind. I think we have quite a few we need to review. So I, um, the interim director has provided us dates and I'm member Nixon, member Crawford, you're the ones that I want to uh, make sure that we accommodate you uh, because of that. So we need to pick a date when we can actually just meet just for that. Review and uh, go over the serious use of force or officer involved shooting cases. So Ms. Diane, I don't remember the dates because you 
tell me the dates again. Um, based on a just kind of looking the couple of months out, uh, potential special meeting days as of at least a few days ago um, was potentially June 23rd or June 30th or July 7th, 11th or 12th. Keep in mind your actual board meeting is July 14th, the 20th, the 21st or pretty much the whole week of the 25th through the 29th. So those are the, as you know, as of this moment, the GovTV availability and, and things like that dates that you could potentially pick from. I think depending on how many cases you were planning on actually putting would sort of dictate how soon or how later in this process you were wanting to put it or if you're going to do more than one or, or what your thought was on that. How big is the backlog? Uh, I do have that, but I don't have it counted. I can send that out to the board members. Um, I did get a spreadsheet, but I didn't actually count them. Some of them are ready. They've gone through FRB, the review process, all of that, and some of them aren't. So uh, well, Just that could be counted as part of our backlog if they haven't gone through the process. I, I was going to say part oh, of the clarification, sorry. yeah, as all of the cases that are on the spreadsheet are ones that have gone through FRB and are available to the board in the materials that you've been given. That link that you, you know, most familiarly looked at today or, you know, this week, I should say, um, all of those cases are actually contained within that link. Now, the exception to that is any case that the board would like to see the full case for, the full materials. Some of those you do have access to because they were already prepared in anticipation and some of them are not. And so the board would have to put it on their agenda to request that and keep in mind that there is at minimum a 30 day lag for the department to be able to then provide all those materials in a redacted form. Um, to then review. So it is a matter of, first off, is the board going to want to see the full case file or is it satisfied with seeing just the uh, minutes and the PowerPoint presentation with the video snippets? So that's kind of the first decision that has to be made. And then uh, how many you wish to do at a time. But yeah, all of the cases that are provided on that uh, spreadsheet are ones that have been through FRB and are available for review. Ballpark number? I'm sorry? Ballpark oh, number? Oh, ballpark. Um, let me see. And do keep in mind that the list continues to grow as more effort is happening. But uh, if you give me a moment, let me see if I can get you a ballpark. Uh, I believe about 37-ish, 36-ish, something like that. As of, uh, I think, April 11th. So of course and that's grown a bit. How many can we reasonably review without reaching diminishing returns in a single meeting? Well, it depends on how much we wanna see. My question to you, um, uh, interim director McDermott is um, the ones on that spreadsheet that you said is a that that are available to us are they available for us right now to look and review and say hey we need more on this or do we have to send you a list or are they on the ones that you sent us today I mean that share that link you sends us sends us to year then to month then to it's it, quite something to maneuver but are they there? At, Correct. So if you take a look, it will say, um, and I know not all the board members, I don't think had the benefit of this, but basically it's APD case number, the date of incident, the case heard at the FRB date, the redacted materials being available to the board, meaning just at this point, the uh, minutes and the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and whether or not the board requested a full file, if it's an OIS or not, meaning officer involved shooting, if the redacted full file is available to the board and, and so on. So 
uh, yes, the majority of the things that are non-OIS, meaning non-officer involved shooting, I don't believe there are any, I think there's one. There's one report that is not available. So that technically, like you said, isn't part of your backlog because there was um, something unfinished on that, but it was on a list that I had some of these materials to kind of know where you were at. Um, I had to look back at some old materials that Dr. Cass, who was sort of your board liaison for this process, um, had. So I had at least the benefit of looking at some of that and then comparing it to the minutes and comparing it to what the materials were going through each of those months and years of that link that you guys have. So that's where this list has, has been put together from. Um, and so after all of that, the majority, and again, the list has grown some, but the majority have except one where uh, it is all available to you for that small part. If you want the full, then that's another process that we have to make sure some of them you have, some of them you don't. And if you want them, we just have to make that request, but just keep in mind the, the lag time. Well, then I'm going to refer to uh, Member Nixon and Member Crawford. I know that both of you, I know Member Nixon has uh, repeatedly informed us he cannot meet before three. So I would say um, probably more than one evening if we want to really catch up on some of these. But I will leave it to those two, uh, Member Nixon and Member Crawford on the dates, times, or whatever, and Currently, remember, Wartell and I, since we're retired, we'll work around your schedule. Well, and since we're doing it by Zoom, that makes it even easier to, to fit in. But it doesn't, it still doesn't answer the question of how we can, uh, what period of time it takes to do a reasonable job on average on a case. Now, let's forget about asking for more information. This is a simple case because that tells you how many times we're going to have to schedule. And, and there is the, uh, the possibility that late in the evening, our brains turn to mush. So. Well, my thoughts on that and, and member Crawford, member Nixon, please let me pipe in here and tell me what you think my th thoughts are. If, if you read them, you know, you come prepared, you know, if you have any questions, you will have the executive director's findings and recommendations if she has some. Those are very important, but you can review the material. And when we, um, when we uh, come to our meeting, we would vote on whether we uh, agree, accept them, don't accept her findings and the FRB findings. That's what we would be voting on. So I can't really give you a time. I guess it comes down to how many questions we're gonna have. I hope by the time we come to our meeting, everyone has already uh, reviewed and prepared uh, for the meeting. So um, do either one of you, um, Member Crawford, Member Nixon, Member Nixon, you have done this for quite a while. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I wanna know what the starting point is. How many um, outstanding cases there are and what the backlog is. And working through it, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that I understand this has to be a consensus because this is a board. It's a do lot you, of time. Do you have some idea of how long each case would take us in a board meeting, that's that was his question, and, and I said, I if we... but you, you know, you're, you're saying that, and in, in looking at all these cases, I think there's a certain amount of time you should spend on it. I mean, I, per case, I don't know, I, I, I don't even know. Somebody's got their hand up. No, never mind. I, I will. Uh... <clears throat> Go ahead, uh, just. Yeah, I was just going to venture. I mean, I think the trick here is that the vast majority of the time investment is not in the meeting. You know, it's it's reviewing the materials before the meeting. I think on average, we probably only spend 
a few minutes on each one of these cases, but, but that's like in the meeting, you know, after we've all reviewed it. And a lot of the time there's just nothing that we end up discussing, but then there's always, you know, there's always the, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't have the case number in front of me, but the one we just talked about that has sure. gone on for months. Um, my just right off the top of my head thinking would be that we should probably schedule two special sessions to start with and that we should take an attitude of of time boxing them of you know basically we go for uh, until an end time and when we hit that end time we table the rest and i think if we don't get through it in two sessions then then we schedule we schedule more that that's my idea And how many um, do um, Member Nixon and Member Crawford, how many would you like us to schedule for the first meeting? Because like you said, most of the work is not done during the meeting and that, you know, having jobs, having families, that sort of thing. I don't want to say, okay, we're going to hear 10 or we're going to hear, you know, that sort of thing. What do you think should be um, a ballpark figure or how many we should uh, try to hear? at the meeting? Should we schedule? I want to make sure I understand. Are we, are we only talking use of force or are we talking complaints? What are we talking? Ask that question again, I'm sorry. Are we talking use of force, complaints, both? What, when you it's say case? Just use of force. This is strictly yeah. use of force. Yes. You I don't know, think I don't have a dog. I'll be honest with you. I don't have a dog in that fight anyway, because I feel like everything is skewed towards APD anyway. We get a redacted file. We get a nice, cute PowerPoint presentation. It's got nice stuff in it. It's got great bullets in it, like I fear for my life and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's all kind of tailored towards this whole idea that everything's being prepared, and we're supposed to look at that. Um, I don't, I don't know. I just don't have a dog in that fight. I, what I want to do as a board member is if I'm going to spend my time, um, I want to spend my time on some, some serious stuff. I want to spend, spend time when, you know, people are being shot or, or, or murdered or, or, or whatever's going on, or there's a just, and I don't know how to filter that out, but I, I will tell you this. If it's something where somebody was in handcuffs because they were on angel dust and they had to pepper spray and that kind of thing, that's going to be a very quick, quick uh, find for me, in my opinion. But when it comes to things where I, I feel like you know somebody's constitutional rights are being tread up, tread upon, then that may take a little bit of time. But I, as a as a rule, for me, I don't spend more than a half hour on something. And if I do, I have to write down what it is I'm seeing that I have more questions on to expand it. And on nine times out of ten, I'm wanting to put that in front of members of, of the board to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Let's compare notes. So I would think no more in one in one um, session. See, that's gonna depend. Cause you can you can table whatever you don't get get past. Um, we can start with something around like five or 10 cases if they're gonna be use of force cases. Because when I go through it, I go through all of the slides. I go through the whole thing to look at it and see what's there, um, which is why I think they're kind of very beautifully manicured just for finding that it's gonna be skewed. But, you know, I try to use an open mind on that. So, you know. Okay, so why don't we start with 10 and I will pick, try to, uh, we, I'll send everybody the spreadsheet uh, and we'll start with 10. But I also need uh, dates for Member Nixon and Member Crawford. Could you give us those dates again? Maybe, Diane, do you have them somewhere where you could put them up on the screen so we could actually check our calendars and view the dates at the same time? Don't exactly have them to put on the screen, but what I can do is I'll put them in the chat. And Jesse, I agree. Two sessions to start out with. You're good with that? Yeah, I think that'll. That'll start okay. 
I'll just tell you like high level, usually Tuesday and Thursday evenings are generally clear for me. The, the warning I have to give you is that I'm expecting to be out of the country for a not very well defined part of mid July, which runs into a lot of those dates. So I would ask that we not schedule it between, I'm going to say the 5th and the 20th of July, because that's a, a chunk of time that I think there's a good chance I would not be able to attend. Where are you going so I can be jealous? It's, it's not that interesting. It's, it's Canada, but we're going to be uh, mostly backpacking on Vancouver Island. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. I'm, I'm not going to have much in the way of internet connectivity. And if I do, you probably wouldn't want to see me after like <laughs> no shower for a week. So. And Tuesdays and Thursdays, are those okay for you? Because I thought those were CPA. <laughs> um, are you through? Yeah, CPA ends. Let me double check that date, but it ends, uh, I think, before everything we're talking about. June 16th is the end of CPA. Okay. The other, the other issue for Interim Director McDermott is that we're presented with the information in such a way that everything is separated. Can you get with some IT people to put them together in the individual cases? So the link, as I said, is, is actually sent from APD. Um, I can request or ask them about somehow of separation. Uh, but I be, basically, they provided the information so that the board had the information so that it could then decide out of all the information, which ones did it want to deal with, basically. Um, so, you know, if you wanted them broken out, I guess we would have to know which ones. I don't know that it's possible. I can basically ask, but that you know, link is coming from me. Aren't we going to look at every use of force case? Right now, being that the ordinance and the CASA, as I was just conferring with um, Council Gooch, so the ordinance says a representative sample, the CASA says all, so all serious use of force that are a level three and all officer involved shootings. So eventually, yes, you're gonna be looking at all of those unless that modification occurs. So what we get, there are basically three components, are there not? There's the PowerPoint, there's the minutes, and there's the recommendation. There's the two components, the, the PowerPoints and the minutes, right. and then the recommendation slash letter. For the ones that I've attended, I have to draft a letter and have it so like whatever you tell me which case numbers you wanted to look or if I'm the one picking you know then I would have that letter available to you um I haven't had the time to be able to write them all in advance but I do have all my notes and everything like that to be able to to draft those letters like I did uh if you're talking about cases that I was not a part of for force review board then you do have the force review board minutes to be able to review and discuss. But my only point is that we, there ought to be a way to subsume the information under a case number instead of having to go to several different places to find it. It's based on the FR, so the materials are separated by the month that they are heard in the force review board. So like, let's just say that as I walked you through, um, I had told you that these cases are from January's force right. review boards. So you went to the month of January in 2022 and all of those cases were there. So for the separation, you'd mostly just need to know what month was the FRB that those particular cases were heard in. But I understand what he's saying. We get everything in that month and all those. And so what he, I agree, if we can download them at, onto our computer, then the agency should be able, with whichever ones we have scheduled, 
should be able to download that information and have it in one place where we can go get it instead of, I mean, it is, it's, you, you got to go here, then you got to download the PowerPoint, then you got to hope that the PowerPoint downloads so then you can then see the video, then you got to go somewhere else to read the FRB report, and it's just, it's time consuming. <laughs> It's back and forth and back and forth. And I'm consuming. Uh, yeah, if I, I can attempt to do that, but it will be time consuming here too. So, you know, it's only so many hours in the day, I suppose, but. But um, I understand that, but surely there's a computer there where you can go in, hit download and then walk and do something else because that's what I have to do. You have to start downloading and then you can do something else and download. But I'm just saying it, it just, ha we have to look at time management for everyone too. And it's, it's, it's like sometimes looking for a needle in a haystack uh, when you're really trying to look at it and download it and then go back. And it's just, it, it's very time consuming and it's not very user friendly the way that we're given this information. So I know that the suggestion had been made to put IT in the budget to see if we could make the agency's job a little easier. I'm not sure if that was done or looked into, but it's something we really need to do because this, this has to be easier for the board members to get the information that they need and the material they, they need um, without going to so many different locations. So I just, I wanna make it better for the agency and the board. So let's look at that. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't wanna be asking for something that my colleagues don't agree with. Jesse, Eric, do you, do you find it as difficult to find the information as I do? I do not like how we get that data, but I understand that that comes directly from APD and that there has been, the entire time I've been on the board, everyone's been complaining about it. And I guess I'm just at the point where I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the way that we get that information unless someone has a concrete option to, I don't know, put pressure on APD to prepare it for us differently or something. Um, but uh, I kind of like the idea of telling interim director McDermott to fix it. <laughs> That's just my attitude. I mean, that is a lot of fun. I think the problem is that we've told the director to fix it for the last like six months, right? And it's just, I don't think it's in the agency's control, this, this issue. Like, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I just, I don't think director McDermott has like any better access well, to this than we I'm, do really. So. <laughs> and, and to be fair, I, I mean, I know the board is just starting back and it's in its use of force. So I personally haven't had the involvement in this, in this role too much um, until recently. So you know, I, I'm certainly have a, you know, a relationship with APD. I can ask if there's different alternatives and figure it out. Um, as to, you know, my understanding was the board had felt it and it worked. And so APD really hadn't had a lot of pressure to change it. Um, now I'm hearing that it's so cumbersome. Um, I don't, you know, basically all I can say is I'll try and ask what I can do and see if there's something alternative. And well, that's all you can do is try to go from there. So Let me I think it's always thing. been. Oh, sorry. Remember next. I was gonna say, I, I think it's always been cumbersome. I, I, to be honest with you, I think it's humorous to a certain point. I work with data all day. I work <laughs> with data in multiple systems, similar to the system that APD has and there is nothing that cannot that, can, that that can't be done as far as the data and getting the data to us. Um, I, I really and I don't know what the motivation for the uh, for what we have to deal with now, but I it's it's really pathetic. That's the only way I can put it. And so even if Diane was to go in and make requests and say, "Hey, can you have the data this way or that way?" Yes, can they do it? Yes, they can. Um, we're supposed to be clear in some way, shape, shape or form. We're supposed to at least be able to see redacted PowerPoints. So when it, when it comes to the actual data, Jesse, I got to tell you, ever since I've been on this board, um, it has been cumbersome, it has been difficult, and it, it, it has been, it has defied logic. I think a lot of it is kind of 
the idea of just putting some data out there and then your your for all intents and purposes, I feel like whenever we get a link, we're gonna have to do some data mining. That's what it feels like to me because nothing is making sense. It would be very easy to say, okay, these are the list of uh, uh, cases that you have and your list of cases are gonna be right here. And then you go and click on a link and boom, the cases are right there for you to download. Very simple, can easily be done. Why isn't it done? I have no idea. And we're going through two, two directors now. And I, I can't point the finger at directors on this because the, the smart people that are supposed to be sitting there next to the servers and the data are supposed to be able to say, yes, we can get that to you. And they're not able to do that. So I'm with you. I'm like, you know, you're going to send me something. We'll see how it goes these first two sessions. I think it'll be a lessons learned, a fact finding mission for you and I. And then, you know, we'll, we'll come back at you, Patty, and go, hey, you know what? This isn't working. Or, or this isn't efficient. This is an efficient use of my time. And we'll, we'll do that. So we'll have to study. But, but this whole idea that, you know, all, all of a sudden we were, we were just fine with the data and now we're not, the data has never been good. Um, I've got a lot of good ideas as far as we, how we can change that to make it much easier, both make it easier for ABD, but also make it easier for us to get what we need so that we can spend more time, um, you know, uh, going through cases versus trying to find them. I agree. If, if it's in a database, it can be uh, separated. It can be, I believe in one month, um, one of the members sent us letters and in each one of those letters was the link to that particular case. Um, we didn't have to go through the year, the month and all of that. It had the individual link to that direct case that you could download. So I, I agree with um, member Nixon, it can be done. Whose responsibility it is, I don't know if we should say APD should do it. It's our board that wants it and maybe our agency should look into the technology and how to do it. Um, so I'm not sure who bears that responsibility, but uh, yeah, we can set up these first two meetings, but that's something I certainly want us to look into because it's very time consuming. And so uh, the interim director put the dates in the chat a member Crawford and member Nixon, have you had an opportunity to nail down two dates? Chair Friend, uh, I'll just offer two things real quick. Number one, if I could just try to make a concrete request with relation to how the data is given to us, I think one of the biggest problems that I have at least is that it's organized by FRB meeting date, which makes a lot of sense to the members of the FRB, but not to me. Um, I don't know if it is realistic to ask APD to, you know, give us a version that is organized by case number, but maybe if you, Director McDermott, might have this info, it would be helpful if we could have on the agenda maybe the month that each case was originally in FRB. That would just make it, make it easier to kind of navigate what we have right now. Um, and then the, the second thing, just, just going to dates is, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty flexible, but if you want two dates from me, I'll just say, uh, rip the bandaid off June 23rd and June 30th. June 23rd and June 30th. Um, yeah, that's um, fine. Are we talking about after three, Jesse? Yeah, I'm assuming these would be in the evening. Uh, if they're not that, that complicates things for me, but. No, we're okay. making in the evening for, for both of you, for member Nixon and member Crawford, I guess the decision is what time in the evening? I know member Nixon, you always say after three, does that work for you member Crawford or later? Or? Um, I think five is kind of ideal for me. Um, I, I can do three, but if, if I could pick a time, I think at five. Okay, five is good. It's fine. Okay. So um, we have that 623 and my pin gave out 623 and what was it again? 22nd 30th. and 30th. Okay. I just for, I don't know if the membership want to consider because you are basically talking every Thursday in the month of June then with the exception of one. Um, that's kind of be a challenge for 
staff and things like that too. So I don't know if you want to break it up a bit more, but I'm just throwing it out there. That's a little hard to have every Thursday of the month of June tied up. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that the staff might not be as excited as I am about uh, let's uh, let's do it all in, in one frightening uh, sprint. I, I do think that maybe yeah, making the second one later would help, but that does come with the downside that I think later for me on the second one would be probably July 25th, which is my birthday. Happy birthday. We'll have to remember that. In case we forget, happy birthday. Yeah. Um, well, that's fine I'm, with me. I don't have a problem with that. If you want to do it after you come back from hiking <laughs> from Canada, that's cool. <laughs> we can do that too. But as far as staff is concerned, I think um, interim director, as long as you're here to present and we have one person to keep the minutes, I think that is sufficient. Um, we, yeah, we do not want to have everybody here just for our meetings. We just need someone to take the minutes. And since they're recorded, even, you know, if we have somebody here to take a roll, take the roll, the minutes can be done at a later time because they're recorded. We just need somebody here to take the role and for you to do the presentation is all we really need. Well, so, and being that a factor, June 30th, actually, I will not be here. So that would be a, a factor <laughs> if my presence is, and again, I might not even be the, you know, at this point, uh, at that point, but, you know, I, I won't actually. So we'll have your cases that you attended the FRB that have to be presented to us by you. So, Not all of them are going to be actually my cases, though. So, I mean, you could always schedule the ones that dealt with just the FRB. So it, it's all workable. I'm just, you know, we have an hourly staff person that is the one that's going to be here. So it's, it's just a challenge to kind of do that many late night meetings. Okay, so um, are we looking at June 23rd and July 25th? Uh, we don't want to have to do it on your birthday. Let's see, pick another date. <laughs> well, um, you know, as I said, generally Tuesdays and Thursdays are best for me. So I think uh, if we look at that same week, that would suggest maybe July 28th, if we just want to be consistent with doing Thursday. At five. Member Nixon, does that work for you? What, what was that date again? Um, Thursday, July 28th. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we'll make it, um, it's just scheduling. I'm not gonna have a motion, but let's just schedule. Do they, do we need to make a motion? I don't think we do, but just to, uh, I'll leave that up to member, uh, excuse me, member. Um, Ms. Barella, do we need a motion? Do you want a motion for the minutes or you'll just put it that these are the days that we selected? You're muted. Um, member, I'm a member. Ms. Barella, there you go. Did you want a motion from us for the minutes or is it, are you fine with just documenting that we have selected June 23rd and July 28th as the uh, meetings, the special meetings for the uh, serious use of force cases? Valerie, we're not able to hear you. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Chair French, if I may, um, you as the chair can call a special meeting, so you do not need a motion in order for the minutes or for purposes Thank of- Thank you, Councillor Gooch. <laughs> okay, then uh, uh, for the minutes, our meeting will be July 23rd and, uh, I mean, excuse me, June 23rd and July 28th. Okay, thank you. And we'll just put that in there and I've made a note in my notes. So we'll move on to um, L, um, Councillor Gooch. Thank you, uh, Chair French and board. There was an OMA complaint to an email about, and I also sent you the proposed response. I would just like if the board 
um, would consider that and make a motion in order to allow me to send it. So moved. Second. Okay. Third. Well, <laughs> we have a motion, a second and a third. Um, Chair French. Well, uh, yes, I see that member. I mean, I see that Ms. Barella cannot be heard. So, um, Kat Katrina? Yes, can you restate the motion? I She's having difficulty, so I'm taking over so I didn't catch the motion. The motion was to approve uh, the response to the OMA complaint and have a uh, composed by council. Uh, you want to restate your motion, Member Wartell? There you are. We have, was, the yeah, motion is to approve the sending of the response to the OMA complaint written by Councillor Gooch. Is that clear, clear enough? And could we have a roll call? Yes, so I have a Wartel making the motion. I'm sorry, who seconded it? Member Nixon. Thank you. Okay. Um, Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartel? Yes. That's a four to zero vote, motion passed. Thank you. We'll move on to the last item on the agenda. And with that one, I'll make a motion to accept the selection of Ms. Deidre Ewing to the position of executive director and the board grant the chair the authorization to communicate and final any um, personnel matters pertaining, pertaining to this hiring process. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, Katrina, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Member Crawford? Yes. Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartel? Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, we'll move on to other business. And I just want to say under other business, um, we potentially have three new board members. And as you all know, um, <laughs> city council has <laughs> told our member Galloway that uh, she could stay on the board until her replacement was selected. Um, member Galloway ha you know, has decided that she has, stayed. Um, she has stayed almost seven years, or over seven years on this board. And I would be remiss not to mention her dedication her loyalty, the time that she spent um, for the board, for the agency, and for the community. And I just appreciate all her efforts, all her time, everything, and, and her expertise on a lot of matter, uh, matters. She was um, a senior board member, and as you say, you only have two terms. Um, but I just want to say how much I appreciate her, and I want to ask staff to look into um, getting her a a minimum of plaque uh, with the years and dedication and um, thanking her for her uh, loyalty and dedication, the time she spent on this board. So and if I'm not mistaken, wasn't she the longest serving member? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know that, yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. So uh, we can definitely look into that, but uh, I just want to personally thank her. Because, um, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. And as I've seen when I first came on this board, it wasn't easy. Uh, so uh, I just wanna say I appreciate that. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? Um, I, I would like one more. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Michelle, I didn't see you. I, there was nothing to see, I didn't raise my hand. Oh, okay. I, I, I just, want to understand from Councillor Gooch. Um, our requirements for a quorum are now three. Chair French member Wartel, that is correct. That's what they were before. And therefore two is not a quorum. That is correct. And, and so we can talk to each other. <laughs> 
Yeah, the quorum hasn't changed, Member Wartell, and I'm sorry, I had already checked into that and I just didn't get back with you. But yes, the quorum has not changed. Okay. That's fine. I thank you. Okay. And I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Katrina, I don't see you. We call the roll. There she is. I'm trying, sorry. Okay. Uh, Member Crawford? Yes. Uh, Member French? Yes. Member Nixon? Yes. Member Wartel? Yes. Meeting adjourned at 9.02. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.